Check, check. Check, 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 one, two, three. Testing, one, two, check, check.
Check, check, one, two.
Good morning. The Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We are here today to examine the FCC's rulemaking process and the agency's commitment to transparency. Three weeks ago, the FCC approved new rules that will dramatically increase the regulation of the Internet. The problem is Americans only got a chance to read them last week. Last month, Chairman Wheeler told members of Congress that releasing the preliminary discussion draft ran contrary, quote, to decades of precedent, end quote, at the, at the Commission. In reality, the current process making changes to Internet rules is far less, transparent than what, less transparent than what occurred with the equally controversial media ownership rule changes in 2007. 2007, then Senator Obama, quote, strongly requested the FCC, quote, put out any changes that they intend to vote on in a new notice of proposed rulemaking, end quote. Senator Obama believed to do, so other, to do otherwise would be, quote, irresponsible. Then Chairman Ke Kevin Martin responded to these concerns by releasing the draft text of the rule changes and inviting a four-week public comment period. In making the text public, Chairman Martin explained, quote, because of the intensely controversial nature of the of the proceeding and my desire for an open and transparent process, I want to ensure that members of Congress and the public had the opportunity to review my proposal prior to any commission action." End quote. That didn't happen in this case. So to suggest that there is no precedent for this, that's just not true. Chairman Martin went even further and in December 2007 testified before Congress more than once about the rule changes. And yet we invited Commissioner Wheeler to come before us and he refused. Didn't have any problem meeting at the White House, but did have a problem coming before Congress. In today's case, Chairman Wheeler did quite the opposite, failed to provide this type of transparency. Chairman Wheeler did not make the rule public, did not invite public comment, and declined to appear before this committee. We find that wholly unacceptable. Further, it appears the FCC has been concealing certain communication from the public without legal basis. I want to put up a slide. We'll refer to this later. But there are several reactions to comments that were made, or to uh, requests that were made for Freedom of Information Act experiences. We have that slide. I guess not. I'm going to keep going. Organizations that hold our government accountable depend on the FOIA process to gain insight into agency decision making. The FCC's track record in responding to FOIA requests is weak at best. At the outset, the FCC denies more than 40 percent of all FOIA requests. The documents FCC does produce contain a number of redactions, including some that black out entire pages of text. This committee has received 1,600 pages of unredacted email traffic previously provided in a highly redacted form through FOIA requests to various organizations, including Vice.com. Today we will compare these communications to understand what legal justification Mr. Wheeler's agency used to prevent this information from becoming public. In addition, in addition, we will examine the series of events resulting in the highly controversial vote to use Title II to regulate Internet like a public utility. In May of 2014, the FCC issued a notice of proposed rulemaking concerning Internet regulation that indicated broadband and mobile services would remain classified under Title I. Public statements made by Chairman Wheeler and communications received by this committee demonstrate that this was Chairman's intent during this time period. In October 2014 and after the FCC's public comment period ended, media reports indicate that Chairman Wheeler intended to finalize a hybrid approach to that, that continued to classify broadband and mobile internet services under Title I. Just days later, President Obama appeared in a YouTube video calling for a radically different proposal, full Title II reclassification similar to a utility or a telephone company. Emails provided the committee by the FCC suggest that this came as a major surprise to the FCC staff, including Mr. Wheeler. On January 7th, Chairman Wheeler announced the FCC would radically alter course and reclassify broadband and mobile services under Title II. I'm sure much will be made about the four million comments that were made, but they were not made in the context of fully changing this to Title II. The FCC adopted the rule change on February 26th in a three to two vote. The lack of transparency sur surrounding the open internet rulemaking process leaves us with a lot of questions. This is a fact-finding hearing. 
The committee remains committed, this committee remains committed to ensuring full transparency across government. And I look forward to hearing more from Chairman Wheeler today. With that, I will now recognize the ranking member from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We are here today to discuss net neutrality, uh, the rule that was adopted last month by the FCC. There are strong opinions on all sides of this issue, no doubt about it. On one hand, Internet service providers, including Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, and Time Warner, opposed the rule and lobbied against it. They argued that additional regulation would increase fees, reduce investment, slow network upgrades, and reduce competition and innovation. On the other hand, supporters of this new rule contend that ISPs should not be allowed to discriminate it based on content. They believe ISPs should be required to act like phone companies, controlling the pipes that make up the Internet, but not what flows through them. Consumers, social media entities, and companies like Facebook, Netflix, and Google favor open Internet policy because they do not want to be charged higher prices to provide their services. The question before the committee is not which policy we may prefer, but whether the process used by the FCC to adopt the rule was appropriate. Republicans who opposed the new rule alleged that President Obama exerted undue influence on the process, but we have seen no evidence to support this allegation. Instead, the evidence before the committee indicates that the process was thorough, followed the appropriate guidelines, and benefited from a record number of public comments. I welcome Chairman Wheeler here today to discuss the process used by the FCC. And I would like to make several points for the record. First, the FCC received more comments on this rule than any other rule in its history. That is indeed very significant. As I understand it, the FCC received about four million comments. This grassroots movement was highlighted when John Oliver, a popular late night talk show host, encouraged his viewers to go on the FCC website to comment on the proposed rule. The number of comments was also extremely high because the FCC established a 60-day comment period twice, twice as long as required by the Administrative Procedures Act. In addition, the President has a right to express his position on proposed rules, and he did so forcefully in this case. In November, he made remarks in support of an open Internet rule, arguing that it is, and I quote, essential to the American economy, end of quote. He said the FCC, and I quote, should create a new set of rules protecting net neutrality and ensuring that neither the cable company nor the phone company will be able to act as a gatekeeper, restricting what you can do or see online, end of quote. When he gave this speech, the President also ensured that his office submitted the appropriate ex parte filing. He did this through the National Communications, Telecommunications and Information Agency, which is tasked with providing the FCC with information about the administration's position on policy matters. Presidents <clears throat> routinely make their positions known to independent agencies regarding pending rules. President Reagan, George H. W. Bush, Clinton and George W. Bush all expressed opinions on FCC regulations during their presidencies. In fact, for this neutrality rule, there were more than 750 ex parte filings from individuals, public interest groups, lobbyists, corporations, and elected officials, all of whom had an opportunity to make their views known. 
Finally, if the committee is going to examine the actions of Chairman Wheeler and his communications with supporters of the rule, then we must also examine the actions of Republicans Commissioner Pay, O'Reilly, and others who oppose the rule. Multiple press accounts indicate that they have been working closely with Republicans on and off, on and off Capitol Hill, to affect the FCC's work, and we should review their actions with the same level of scrutiny. Chairman Wilder, I want to thank you again for appearing before our committee today, and I look forward to your testimony. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. I'll hold the record open for five legislative days for any member who'd like to submit a written statement. We'll now recognize our witness, the Honorable Thomas Wheeler, Chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. We welcome you here today and glad that you could join us. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn before they testify. So if you will please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. I appreciate it. In order to allow time for discussion, we, will, uh, we normally ask for your testimony to be limited to five minutes, but we're very forgiving on this. Uh, we would appreciate your, your verbal comments. Your entire written, rec written statement will be made part of the record. Mr. Wheeler. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, ranking member, members of the committee. I will uh, uh, take that hint as well as uh, your forgiveness and try and uh, skip through some early paragraphs uh, here. Uh, I'm proud of the process that the Commission ran to develop the Open Internet Order. It was one of the most open and most transparent in Commission history, and the public's participation was unprecedented. Last April, I circulated a draft notice of proposed rulemaking that included a set of open internet protections and also asked questions about the best way to achieve an open internet. The open internet NPRM adopted in May proposed a solution based on section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. It also specifically asked extensive questions as to whether Title II of the Communications Act of 1934 would be a better solution. A quick point on our procedures. While historically some NPRMs just ask questions, during my chairmanship, I've made it a policy to present draft NPRMs to my colleagues that contain specific proposals as a means to flag key concepts for commenters' attention. I believe this is an important part of an open and transparent rulemaking process, but let's be clear. The proposal is tentative, not a final conclusion, and the purpose of the comment period is to fully test that concept. In this instance, as in others, it worked in the desired way to focus the debate. The process of the open internet rulemaking was one of the most open and expansive processes the FCC has ever run. We heard from startups, we heard from ISPs, we heard from a series of public roundtables. As Mr. Cummings mentioned, we heard from 750 different ex partes. We heard from over 140 members of Congress. We heard from the administration, both in the former President Obama's very public statement on November the 10th and in the form of NTIA's formal submission. But here I would like to be really clear. There were no secret instructions from the White House. I did not as CEO of an independent agency, feel obligated to follow the President's recommendation. But I did feel obligated to treat it with the respect that it deserves, just as I have treated with similar respect the input both pro and con from 140 senators and representatives. And most significantly has been pointed out, we heard from four million Americans. We listened and learned throughout this entire process, and we made our decision based on a tremendous public record. My initial proposal was to reinstate the 2010 rules. The tentative conclusion put forth in the NPRM suggested that the FCC could assure Internet openness by applying a commercial reasonableness test under Section 706 to determine appropriate behavior of ISPs. As the process continued, 
I listened to countless consumers, innovators, and investors around the country. I also reviewed the submissions in the record and became concerned that the relatively untested, commercially reasonable standard might be subsequently interpreted to mean that it, what was reasonable for ISPs, commercial arrangements, not what was reasonable for consumers. That, of course, would be the wrong conclusion, and it was an outcome that was unacceptable. And so that's why over the summer I began exploring how to utilize Title II and its well-established just and reasonable standard. <laughs> As previously indicated, this was an approach on which we had sought comment in the NPRM and about which I had specifically spoken, saying that all approaches, including Title II, were very much on the table for consideration. You have asked whether there were secret instructions from the White House. Again, I repeat, the answer is no. Now the question becomes whether the President's announcement on November 10th had an impact on the open internet debate, including at the FCC. Of course it did. The push for Title II had been hard and continuous from Democratic members of Congress. The President's weighing in to support their position gave the whole Title II issue new prominence. Of course, we had been working on approaches to Title II, including combined Title II Section 706 solution for some time. The President's focus on Title II put wind in the sails of everyone looking for strong open internet protection. It also encouraged those who had been opposing any government involvement to, for the first time, support legislation with bright line rules. And as I considered Title II, it became apparent that rather than being a monolith, it was a very fluid concept. The record contained multiple approaches to the use of Title II. One of those was the Title II Section 706 hybrid approach that bifurcated, some would say artificially, internet service. Another, the approach we ultimately chose, used Title II and Section 706 but without bifurcation. And still another, the one the President supported, was only Title II without Section 706. All of these were on the table prior to the President's statement. But let me be specific. We were exploring the viability of a bifurcated approach. I was also considering using Title II in a manner patterned after its application in the wireless voice industry. And I had from the outset indicated a straight Title II was being considered. A key consideration throughout this deliberation was the potential impact of any regulation on the capital formation necessary for the construction of broadband infrastructure. An interesting result of the President's statement was the absence of a reaction from the capital markets. When you talk about the impact of the President's statement, this was an important data point resulting, I believe, from the President's position against rate regulation. It was, of course, the same goal that I had been looking to achieve from the outset. As we moved to a conclusion, I was reminded how it was not necessary to invoke all 48 sections of Title II. In this regard, I've been considering the substantial success of the wireless voice industry after it was deemed a Title II carrier pursuant to Section 332 of the Communications Act. In applying Title II, but limiting its applicable provisions, the Congress and the Commission in that act enabled a wireless voice business with hundreds of billions of dollars of investment and a record of innovation that makes it the best in the world. This is the model for the ultimate recommendation that I put forward to my colleagues. There were other industry data points that informed my thinking in the Commission's analysis. One was the recognition of interconnection as an important issue a topic not addressed by the President. Another was my letter to Verizon Wireless about its announcement of to limit unlimited data customers if the subscriber went over a certain amount of data, a policy it ultimately reversed. A particular note was the active bidding and ultimately overwhelming success of the AWS 3 Spectrum auction at the end of 2014 and the beginning of 2015, which showed that investment in networks even in the face of the potential classification of mobile internet access under Title II, continued to flourish. 
Other industry data points included the work of Wall Street analysts and the statements of the ISPs themselves. Sprint, T-Mobile, Frontier, and hundreds of small rural carriers said that they would continue to invest under this Title II framework that we were developing. Ultimately, the collective findings of the public record influenced the evolution of my thinking and the final conclusion that modern, light-touch Title II reclassification, accompanied by Section 706, provides the strongest foundation for open Internet rules. Using this authority, we adopted strong and balanced protections that assure the rights of Internet users to go where they want, when they want, protect the open Internet as a level playing field for innovators and entrepreneurs, and preserve the economic incentives for ISPs to invest in fast and competitive broadband networks. I stand ready to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll <laughs> recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Chairman, did you or the FCC ever provide the White House the proposed rule prior to the final vote? No, sir. The, uh, the comment period was open May 15th. How many times did you meet either at the White House or did the White House officials come meet with you during that time? In total? I mean, about, yes. about any issue? I think that we have shown you my calendar that has something like 10. June, 10, June 11th with Jason Furman, correct? You, you have the list, sir. June 18th with Jeffrey Zients, Carolyn, Caroline Atkinson, June, July 17th. September 11th, Jeffrey Zients. September 30th, Megan Smith. October 15th, Jason Furman. October 28th, Jeffrey Zients. And then uh, Mr. Zients visiting with you on and, uh, November uh, 9th at the FCC. Does that sound accurate? Uh, that's, the, that's the list that we provided, sir. And yet you only provided an ex parte for one of those meetings. Why is that? Um, first of all, the rules are quite clear on what constitutes uh, an ex parte, um, and that is an attempt to uh, file specifically in a specific docket and to influence the outcome of that docket. Did you discuss this? It's just to, uh, and. Did and. you discuss this are, matter during those meetings? And there are um, provisions long established going back to, I think, the Bush administration, Office of Legislative Council. Sir, I have five saying, minutes. Saying I, I need to ask very specific questions. I need to ask you a question that, that, that there is no requirement. You're asking about ex partes, and there is no requirement that there be an ex parte filed. There was no need for an ex parte to be filed either. I just want to make sure that we have both. Well, I, I don't understand that. You met with them. Are you telling me that this proposed rule did not come up in any of those meetings but one? Uh, I don't know the details of uh, those meetings. I can't recall the details of those meetings. I can assure you that there were no, nothing that would trigger uh, an ex parte, and that in fact. So you're meeting with you meet with the White House multiple times during the open comment period, after the the comment period closes, and we're supposed to believe that one of the most important things the FCC has ever done that this didn't come up, and you didn't have any discussions, that they didn't comment back to you about what you were doing. Is that what we're supposed to believe? The administration was very scrupulous in making it clear that I was an independent agency, and that they were. But you not were meeting. Telling us. I guess the point do. is, Chairman, you met with them multiple times. They came to visit you. You went to visit them. But we invite you to come in an open, and you refuse. We ask you to send us some documents. You didn't send us a single one, and that that double standard is very troubling for us. I Mr. need to move Mr. on. Chairman, I just I, one one thing here that 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 I did agree to come. I, I'm here. No, but um, before and the I, rule, and you I, met with the White House before asked, the rule, you but asked, you didn't meet here. You gave me a week's notice. You asked for the. That's usually what of, we give people, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, there are other committees that I'm also trying to respond to. I said in the response, I would look forward to coming to you, and I, I look yeah, and to I didn't believe you that. then, and I don't believe you now. You said that you were, you would not come to visit with us. You didn't send us a single document that we asked for before that rule. That's just not right. I think we've sent you 1,800 I, documents after the rule. What I, my complaint There's is, my complaint is that beforehand you didn't. And you met multiple times away. Challenge, Chairman, challenge. I, I'm moving on. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> I, our time is short. This is the way it works. On September 23rd, multiple people met at the White House. I'm going to enter into the record, ask unanimous consent, this uh, Daily Caller article of uh, 
uh, February 23rd, 2015. Uh, White House logs showing that number of people met at the White House uh, that are activists on this topic. I want to play a video clip. This is, uh, this is the 6.55 in the morning of the day that the president is going to issue his statement. This is you, right, at, at your home? Yes, sir. And you, had, you woke up that morning to protesters out in front of your house. They laid down or sat down in front of your car, wouldn't let you get out of your driveway. Uh, they were there trying to make a, a, quite a statement, and there's a long five-minute video of this. At 7.35 that morning, you sent out an email to your fellow commissioners calling it an interesting development. And then later that afternoon, I want to put up a slide. Now, when this was provided to Vice.com, you redacted this. This was all redacted. Hard to see up on this screen, but uh, we don't understand why this was redacted. This is what you wrote. In fact, if you'd want to read it, go ahead. F this is the same day. 6.55 in the morning, protesters show up, 7.30, you're sent 7.35, you're sending out a concern. Then all of a sudden, the president's statement comes out in a very coordinated fashion. You, I, he has the right to weigh in on this. I, 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 that's fine. But later that afternoon, you sent, you sent out this email. It says, FY, isn't it interesting? The day of the demonstration just happens to be the day folks take action at my house. The video of POTUS just happens to end up the same message as the video for POTUS. The White House sends an email to the supporters list asking, quote, please pass this on to anyone who cares about saving the internet, end quote. And then you write, hmm. Why did you write that? Um, does this suggest a secret plan and secret set of instructions? I'm asking you why you wrote it. It's your I, language. I think that it, <laughs> this clearly is uh, showing that, that there was no kind of coordination. <laughs> you think that there was no coordination. The protesters show up, just happen to show up the morning before the announcement comes. Nobody knows that the president's going to make this announcement, except the protesters who show up at your home. And you're saying that the, you're the one that wrote that you thought, hmm, isn't it interesting? Well, I, excuse me, I, I wasn't speaking clearly, clearly. Um, no, I'm talking about the coordination with us at the commission. I don't know who else they were coordinating with, and this suggests that maybe they were coordinating with others. But and so you us. had multiple meetings with the White House. They came to visit you, and we're supposed to believe that there was only one discussion about this? Is that still your testimony? They came, let me be really clear, they came once to meet with me and filed an ex parte at, yes, which time that's I true. Was, at which time I was told, as the ex parte says, this is, the president is going to make an announcement uh, and on a couple days later, um, and he's going to endorse uh, Title II. That's all I knew. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, other meetings uh, at the White House, you know, I was there on trade. I was there on national security issues. I was there on spectrum. I was there on auctions. I was there on E-rate. I mean, there were <laughs> numerous uh, issues. Uh, and um, and I, mean, I, I mean, Carolyn Atkinson was one of the names that you named uh, in your, when you were going through lists. I can assure you I didn't talk to her about open internet because she knows nothing about open internet. That entire conversation and several that I have had with her um, have been about trade issues and, um, and the process for reviewing um, agreements uh, that relate to, uh, to national security items. But you only spoke one time with Jeffrey <laughs> Zients about uh, this, one time. The only time that Jeffrey Zients said to me, this is what the president's position is, was when he came and filed an ex parte saying that. I have been repeatedly saying, I know the president has a strong position in favor of the open internet, as do I and keeping them informed that I was fighting for a strong open internet position. So you inform them, and you tell me they had no reaction, no comments. I informed them that they had strong, that I had a strong position in favor of. As a matter of fact, I believe you have emails that show that I have uh, emails with them saying, hey, these press reports that I'm watering this down aren't true. I have lots more questions, but my time is far exceeded. We'll now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. 
Oh, sorry, Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch of Vermont, recognize. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's get right to this. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, this was probably one of the most contentious questions, public policy questions, that we faced in the time I've served in Congress. Four million uh, comments. All of us as members of Congress received comments. The two things that I understood were of concern to you and your fellow commissioners, Republican and Democrat, were how would whatever decision you made affect innovation in capital formation, the build out, is that correct? That was the balance, sir. And was that something that over time you all debated uh, to try to figure out what would be the impact of whatever direction you took? Yes, sir. I mean, the whole rulemaking process is an evolutionary process. And as I said in my statement, the whole concept uh, of what Title II is is a fluid and evolutionary process. All right. And the premise of this hearing seems to be almost like a Watergate type of deal. What did you know and when did you know it? But in public policy, when you're trying to figure out what you can know and get to a good public policy decision, it's a back and forth discussion. It's listening to the four million comments. It's listening to members of Congress. Oh, and incidentally, the President of the United States, elected by everybody, is a relevant uh, commentator. Is that correct? I can tell you I was constantly learning through this All right. process. Now, there was in the New York Times a report about a previous a matter at the FCC where President Reagan had the commissioner in for 45 minutes. Did President Obama ever summon you to the White House for the purpose of a 45-minute discussion about the way it's going to be with this order that you were considering? No, sir. President Obama has never summoned me to the White House to discuss anything the FCC is doing. All right. And you indicated on this capital formation issue after the president, who, by the way, was obviously aware of the enormous grassroots concern about the outcome, uh, that when he made his comment, you observed what was the impact on the markets, correct? Yes, sir. It was and what was that impact? There was, there was zero impact um, on the market. And one of the concerns that all of the ISPs had been making is understand what the consequences of an action in Title II may be on the markets. And lo and behold, there wasn't. And in fact, in the, in the case of another country that's done this, Denmark, I believe, have they continued to have open access uh, and capital formation with respect to the build out of their internet? You are better informed than I am, sir, on Denmark. Okay. Now, just on this capital formation issue, you mentioned the Spectrum auction. Did that exceed what was expected to be revenues from that auction? Uh, significantly. We raised uh, about $41 billion, which was uh, triple what some of the estimates were. And with respect to the market since then, has there been any major disruption that can be attributed to the decision that you made? Um, the market has continued to advance northward on the valuations of these stocks. All right. And my understanding as well is one of your enormous concerns when you initially proposed possibly, uh, possibly using Section 706 was a wariness about having too heavy-handed a regulation, so uh, regulatory regime. Now, is, and you have some history in the industry, were there factors that you took into consideration in the decision on Title II about what type of regulatory framework that would be applicable? Yes, sir. The, um, the model that was built for the wireless industry, which um, the wireless industry sought, by the way, um, was to use Title II and to have them declared a common carrier, but then to forbear, to not enforce uh, those parts of Title II that are no longer relevant. And is it your intention to work with your fellow commissioners, both Republican and Democrat, in order to achieve that light touch approach? Yes, sir, and I believe this rule has. As a matter of fact, there are 48 sections to uh, Title II, and we have forborne from 27 of those, and that just compares with the 19 that were forborne from in the wireless environment. Okay, I want to go back basically to the money question here, the suggestion that somehow, some way, <coughs> uh, President Obama, who has a right to express an opinion, muscled you and the commission into doing something that you did not want to do, and his suggestions that that was the case, uh, the chairman's indicated a number of meetings you had with folks from the White House. I just want to give you an opportunity to say whether the president gave you directions, explicit or implicit, as to how you should do your job or left it to you to exercise your judgment and your persuasive abilities with your fellow commissioners? Uh, no, the president uh, did not. And I interpreted what the president's statement was, was that he was joining with 
the 64 Democratic members of Congress and the millions of people, and that he was identifying with them. Thank you, Mr. Willer. I yield back. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wheeler, in your testimony, you said the notice of proposed uh, rulemaking adopted in May proposes a solution based on Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act. In fact, that seems to be your position throughout most of 2014, uh, a 706-based approach. In fact, you testified on May 20th of last year in front of the Energy and Commerce Committee that Section 706 approach is sufficient to give the FCC what it needs for an open Internet. And as late as October 30th of last year, the Wall Street Journal wrote, and I quote, Chairman Wheeler will move forward with a 706-based approach. Now, back to where the chairman was. All that seems to change on November 10th. So the quite, where, you, where you state publicly that now Title II is definitely in the mix, and that's ultimately the direction that the Commission took. So my question is real simple. What changed between October 30th and November 10th? Mr. Jordan, I think that's an incorrect assumption. I'm using your statements, Mr. Well, me, Wheeler. I'm me, using what the Wall Street Journal, did the Wall Street Journal get it I, right, or were they wrong? Let me, so on February 19th, I said, that we keep Title II authority on the table. The Commission has authority to use I'm Title II. I'm not disputing that. I got three, I got three I, minutes. Just, hang on, there's hang a, on, hang There's on, a laundry on. list, sir. Hang on, hang on. Yeah. Where, where but, I said that. But your testimony, I'm quoting from today's testimony you just read. Mm -hmm. The proposed rule was a 706-based approach, and the Wall Street Journal, as late as October 30th, said a 706 approach was what Chairman Wheeler was going to move forward with. It changes on the 10th. What happened between the 30th and the 10th seems to me two events. One, the President made his YouTube video and commented and moved towards a Title II approach, and he issued his statement. And two, you had an important meeting with Mr. Zients on November 6th. I think that's an incorrect assumption, sir. I'm going from and the it, timeline. This stuff well, you I'm, provided let me, let me quote from the New York Times the day after no, 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 the I'm, Wall Street no, Journal no, saying there are four well, options you can, on you the can, table. You can respond when I ask you a question. That's okay. how it works. All right. So now let me just go through where the chairman was earlier, your interactions with the White House. March 6, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler meets with Jeff Zients. Now, here's where you get to answer something. Who's Jeff Zients, by the way? He is the head of the National Economic Council. Okay, at the White House, right? An yeah. assistant to the President for Economic Policy. He's got this long title, right? Correct. Okay, so you meet with him on March 6. March 7, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler meets with the White House Economic Advisor Jeff Zients. May 7, meeting with Jeff Zients at the White House. May 21st, Tom Wheeler meets with Jeff Zients at the White House. June 11th, Tom Wheeler meets with the Economic Council's advisors at the White House. June 18th, Wheeler meets with Jeff Zients at the White House. September 11th, Tom Wheeler meets with Jeff Zients at the White House. October 15th, Tom Wheeler meets again with White House Economic Advisors. And October 28th, Tom Wheeler meets with Jeff Zients at the White House. So again, leading up to October 30th, you've met with the White House nine different times, all at the White House, with Mr. Zients, who's the assistant to the President for Economic Policy. And up through October, the position of the commission, according to the Wall Street Journal, according to your testimony in front of Congress, is a 706-based approach. That changes just a few days later. And I would argue it changes on November 6th, when again you met with Mr. Zients. But the one difference here, Mr. Wheeler, the one difference here is nine times you went to the White House on November 6, Jeff Zients comes to you. As I look at the record, this is the only time he came to you. And my contention is, and I think where the chairman is, and frankly where a lot of Americans would be as they look at this record is, Jeff Zients came to you and said, hey, things have changed. We want the Title II approach to this rule. Now, am I wrong? Yes. Um, first of all, the, there may have been nine meetings, but I'm telling you, there's a, I listed them a moment ago, and I won't go through them again. Alone. No, there are nine meetings at the White House where you went to the White House. There's the one meeting list, where Jeff Zients comes to you. Dealing about dealing with trade, And the meeting when he comes cyber, to you is right before with, everything dealing changes. Dealing with auctions and, as I said in my testimony, before um, the, there was any uh, input, there were multiple issues on the table, including a Title II and 706 approach. I got in a 29 hybrid. seconds. Hang on one second. I, but Mr. I'm, I'm just, but the, what I'm trying to, it is a mistake to say that the only thing that was on the table was Section 706. 
I'm not, I didn't say that. I thought you had, you didn't. No, I said nine that. times you met with him and you had testified in front of Congress, 706, and the Wall Street Journal report, that's what you were going to do, I, and then it changes a couple days later. And the Wall I got Street 11 Journal seconds. report was wrong. I got 11 seconds. In your testimony, you say, I want to be clear. <clears throat> there were no instructions from the White House. I did not, as CEO of an independent agency, feel obligated to follow the President's recommendations. Mr. Uh, one last question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, who is Philip Verveer? He is a advice. special counsel in my office, senior, so he, count, senior counsel in my office. Your top lawyer, your top advisor, senior counsel. He's, a, he's an advisor, yes. Okay, well, this is an email our staff had got with Mr. Verveer and a lobbyist from AT&T on the 10th, the day this all changes, four days after Mr. Zients came to you. After you went nine times to the White House in the course of a year, Mr. Zients comes to you, everything changes, and this is what the AT&T representative said to your senior counselor, this is awful and bad for any semblance of agency independence. Too many people saw Zeintz going in to meet with Tom last week. So I'm not the only one who thinks everything changed on November 6th. This individual talked to your senior counselor and said things changed on November 6th, when again, the White House came to you and said, Mr. Wheeler, new sheriff in town, things are different, it's Title II from this point forward. And that's ultimately what you all adopted. Even though you had a 706 plan all this time, you ultimately adopted the Title II approach. We did not Gentlemen. adopt the President's, we did not adopt a Title II approach. We adopted a Title II and Section 706, which I believe, I can't read it all, but I think it's referenced in the first line of, of that email. Jim, Independent agency, and this guy says- The gentleman's time, I, I, gentleman's time has expired. Now recognize the Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, sure. uh, with all due respect, the gentleman just went over a minute and a half, and I, at least I would ask that he be allowed to answer sure. that question. I, uh, unanimous consent. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. The, Thank you. There were, and as I was pointing out, the New York Times actually wrote the day after this Wall Street Journal article, quote, that hybrid, quote, is one of the four possibilities the FCC is considering as it seeks to draw up a net neutrality framework that, unlike the last two attempts, will hold up in court. The Title II and 706 usage, as I said in my testimony, was on the table along with a Title II and 706 non-hybrid, along with 706, along with Title II by itself. Mr. Chairman? Now recognize the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, uh, it has been reported that the proposed uh, open uh, net neutrality rule received uh, four million comments. Uh, and I'm uh, curious, uh, compared to other rules before the FCC, did any other rule get anywhere near these, uh, not this number of comments? No, ma'am, uh, and it broke our IT system. I, I heard that. And uh, do you have a, a sense of what percentage of the comments were in favor of uh, net neutrality? I know that thousands of comments came into my office, and all of them were in favor of an open internet and net neutrality. What about your, your comments? I think they ran about three to one in favor. Three to one in favor. Uh, there were also several online petitions. I know of one free press, but there were several others. Are you aware of these online petitions? Yes, ma'am. And I, I also know that there were demonstrations even in your, <laughs> your, your, high, in your house and, and open meetings and forums and all kinds of comment periods that you participated in. And I, I assume uh, you're familiar with the popular uh, late night uh, host, uh, John Oliver. He had a piece about net neutrality this summer that went viral, and he was highly critical of you and your time as a lobbyist. Are you aware of his program? Uh, yes, ma'am. I had <laughs> new uh, research that I had to do on what a dingo was. Okay. Well, um, he encouraged his viewers in this program to go to the FCC site and to register their, their position. And I understand that after his piece aired, that you had to extend the comment period, that it even broke down. There were so many comments coming in favor, coming in, in favor of uh, net neutrality and an open internet. Is that true? Yes, ma'am. So do you have any idea how many comments were submitted 
after John Oliver's show, did you break that down? How many came in? I don't know that off the top of my head I can get that for you. But Would I, you get that for yeah. the committee? Yes, ma'am. And all that uh, attention on you and the efforts of the individuals that commented, the grassroots organizations, and the John Oliver piece, uh, is it fair to say that they had some impact on your decision-making process? Is that correct? Well, they all went into the record, number one. Um, and the decision was made on the record. Um, and uh, obviously there was a high level uh, of concern. I also met around the country. I know, you uh, went all around the country and, holding and public forums and, and those listening to impact. comments. Those uh -huh. had great impact. So, so I'd, I'd like to, to, to ask you, I, I'm very curious, in your opinion, uh, who, who had the greater impact on the FCC's rule? Uh, President Obama's comment or John Oliver's show? <laughs> well, you know, I tend to view that what was going on was the president was signing on to the 64 members of Congress and the millions of people who had told him they want Title II. So I, I, I sincerely want to thank you, um, Chairman Wheeler. It appears that the voices of the American people uh, were listened to and that you made the proper choice. Uh, I commend you for, for keeping an open mind during this process and for doing what is right for the American people and I believe the economy. So, so I would just say, and all due respect, I believe that my Republican colleagues are, are looking at this issue in the wrong way. They should be thanking President Obama for coming out uh, strongly in favor of an open internet rule, clearly where the American public is and clearly where the economists are, and they shouldn't be criticizing him. What I'm hearing here today is similar to the hearings we've had on the auto industry, where the restructuring that President Obama did to the, uh, with the support of Congress uh, to the auto industry, it was highly critical. They were very critical of it. But now it's reported it saved 500 jobs. We are now exporting autos we had the biggest sales of American autos in the history of our country. It was the right decision, and I believe this is the right decision for the American people, and I want to thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The gentleman will lay the yield. I most certainly will. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, much has been made <coughs> about um, between some of the FCC staff on November 10th, um, 2014, the day of the President's announcement. Up until the President's announcement, were a majority of the public comments in favor of open, uh, an open net policy? Yes, sir. Uh, in light of all of these public comments, mm -hmm. was Title mm -hmm. II uh, being explored by your staff? Uh, we were deep into uh, Title II and a Title II 706 combination. Mr. Ranking Member, may I reclaim my time? Of course. I, I just want to end by saying that President Obama saved the auto industry. He saved the auto industry, and he saved the Internet. And uh, I believe very strongly that Republicans are on the wrong side of this issue for the economy and for the American people. I think the gentlewoman will now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. And um, you know, I think this boils down to people are trying to figure out um, why you are against the president's policy on net neutrality <coughs> before you became for the president's policy and uh, in a very abrupt turn. And some of it evolves around circumstances. The Zeit meeting with you um, appears to be uh, very influential. influential. It appears, too, from some of the communications I've seen back May 15th, is that when you were uh, releasing the uh, NPRM? Yes, sir. May, yeah. Uh, I've got a copy of an email from um, Senate Chief of Staff. Uh, this is Mr. Reed's Chief of Staff at the time, uh, David Crone. You know him? Yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, it appears like um, there was... Uh, Enlistment to try to keep the, your previous position uh, in intact. Uh, uh, he said, "Good luck today. Not sure how things have landed, but trust to make it work." Please shout out if you need anything. Spoke last night. Spoke again last night with the White House and told them to back off Title II. 
um, went through once again the problems it creates for us. Um, do you remember this uh, email? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, it appears that, and you know, in defense of your trying to come up with a certain position, that people were uh, trying to back you. It looks like Senator Reid was backing you at that time, right? Or at least this is the, the indication we have. And he was trying to get the White House to back off uh, pressuring you. Is that correct? So I'm really grateful that, that for this question, Mr. Micah, because um, there's, I think, a couple of things that are important to respond to it. One is that the president was clear he was for a strong open internet but during before, his campaign. But before you as, were his, as, as for his position, you were against his position. And, and I was about and to say. you had allies that were trying about, to help you, including, the, I mean, Reid was a big cheese at that time, and this is his chief of staff. I was the chief of staff in the Senate. I know the power that they wield. Yes, sir. I, and what I was what I was saying is, yeah. the, the bef against it before you were for it, the answer in that is no. Well, no. Because, I mean, everything because, we have, just, every public document, and some of it's been cited here. You were taking a different course. You took a different course too, and even br rolling this out, you draft a proposal, or pro uh, offered a proposal. Is that correct? <laughs> is it? I have testified, sir, and the that proposal this is an was evolutionary. Very, this was an evolutionary process. The proposal was process. very scant. Uh, I started on, out with seven On mention of Title II. Uh, no, it was very rich in well, the mentioning of Title II, and well, specifically seven, said, "Is it better?" Okay. Um, but 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 be that as it may, this, but, uh, as I said, this position, is an evolutionary process, yeah. and the the job of a regulator is to put forth a well, proposal to see what it attracts yes, in terms again, of concerns but, and to learn <laughs> from that experience and to evolve. And that's what I did but through this see, entire everything, process. But see, everything we have indicates that you were headed in a d different direction. You're trying to stem the tide of the White House. I mean, it, I, you were in an awkward position. And even Commissioner uh, Pai, is it? He said in his dissenting statement, President Obama, Obama's endorsement of Title II forced a change in the FCC's approach. So maybe everyone else who's been observing this process, your comments up to date, and even one of the commissioners uh, is in conflict with what you believe. Mr. Micah, before the president made his yeah. comment, we were working on a Title II and 706 solution. After well, he made his comment, he, we delivered a Title II and in I Section think, 706. I think Mr. Zeitz on November 6th strong-armed you and uh, that was, I mean, it's pretty, pretty evident, and uh, everyone saw it. Mr. Chairman, let me yield to you. Um, can we put up the slide, please? I want to know why you felt compelled to communicate with the White House about what the New York Times is writing. This is uh, back in April 2023. You start with this as uh, the New York Times is moving a story that the FCC is gutting the open internet rule. It is flat out wrong and unfortunately has been picked up by various outlets. You go through and explain it. Then you, you, you send that to Jeffrey Zients. Then you also send one to John Podesta. Sorry, I should have uh, had you on the first email. Podesta writes back to you, brutal story. Somebody going to go on the record to push back? You write back to him, yes, I did with a statement similar to what I emailed you. You're you're supposed to be an independent agency, and you're interacting regularly with, with the White House on how to communicate on the PR of a New York Times story? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, I had said that we were going to reinstate the 2010 rules, which the President had endorsed. The report in the New York Times was saying he's not doing that. I was therefore responding and saying, you should know that that report is not true. At the same point in time, I have furnished you also emails to members of Congress, Democratic members of Congress, saying the same point. Uh, and, and that was what this was. This was, look, the 2010 rules, I stand behind and I am not out in a campaign to gut them, which is what was being reported in the press. And one of the, if I may, in one of the subsequent emails I sent, as you will recall, was an article that said, oh, wait a minute, this was mischaracterized. And, um, and that's what that exchange was about. Then why are you redacting all of this in a FOIA request? 
How does that meet the standard of FOIA? Why is this oh. redacted? Uh, I got to tell you that the FOIA, how we respond to FOIA is done by career staff, not in my supervision, based on long-standing procedures. I, I can't answer why certain things are blacked out. This administration might want to take some lessons about FOIA and how to respond to it, because I'm tired of having the heads of the agency saying, oh, I don't know anything about it. This is the public's right to know. This is how the public understands what's happening and not happening. And your organization is redacting this information, and it's wrong. I need a further explanation. When can you give us a further explanation as to why these types of material is, is, is redacted? What's a reasonable time to respond? I'll, I'll be happy to have the staffs work and provide that to you. By with when? Ex with expedition. I mean, you know. Can you give me a date? <laughs> By the end of the month? Is that fine? Sure. Oh, thank you. We'll now recognize the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Wheeler. You know, it's very hard to make a case <laughs> against net neutrality. And you know, these members don't want to go home and make that case. So they're trying to make a case, for example, against uh, uh, hearing the opinion of the President of the United States uh, on net neutrality. This is a very important policy issue. It is inconceivable uh, in our republic that the president would be silenced on it. And I, I, I ran an independent agency. I looked to see what the rules were in this case. Uh, it, the, the, the fact that the, of, of administration weighing in on uh, such a, a notion is not new, is it? No, ma'am. Uh, in fact, uh, I was able to discover that President Reagan H.W. Bush, Clinton, George W. Bush have all weighed in specifically on FCC policies in the past. Is that not correct? Yes, ma'am. I can understand that in, in such a case where there might be some appearance, after all, you are an independent agency and you must abide by that independence, that you would go to your Office of Legal Counsel and as it turns out, there is an Office of Legal Counsel's opinion advising uh, uh, the then President George H.W. Bush on whether it was indeed permissible for that president to contact the FCC to advocate for a specific position on rulemaking. Is that not correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, now, because this is the President of the United States you know, and not one of our constituents, it's interesting to note that there are rules about how this should be done. That needs to be laid out here since the President is being criticized, you are being criticized, the Commission is being criticized. Um, and that has to do with disclosure. Uh, uh, the legal opinion stated whether or not uh, these uh, matters must be disclosed in rule making on the record if they are of substantial significance. Is that not the case? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the opinion also addressed whether it is permissible for the FCC to solicit the views of White House officials, solicit the views of White House officials, <coughs> and whether these would be subject to public disclosure. Is that not correct? Yes, ma'am. So here we have rules uh, saying, yes, you must, in yes, Mr. President, we're not going to silence you on an important issue, but we're going to make clear that your views are absolutely transparent. Uh, so there is no law prohibiting the FCC from soliciting the opinion of the White House. There are no rules. And it is in the discretion of whether the, the White House would have to, the, the, whether the FCC would have to d disclose that communication. Is that not correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the White House would be required to submit ex, an ex parte filing only if its response was of substantial significance and clearly intended to affect the ultimate decision. Is that not the case? Yes, ma'am. Did not the White House submit 
an ex parte filing on November the 10th, 2014. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, I submit that this has been the, the rules have been followed to the letter. This has been an openly transparent uh, matter. The president was not and should not have been silenced. If there were more uh, Americans wanting to submit their opinions, you can imagine that those Americans would also want to know where the President of the United States stood on this matter. And I thank you very much and yield yeah, back my time. Please. I would, I would cl be glad to yield. Thank you. Mr. Wheeler, you are, when you come into office, you're sworn in, is that right? Yes, sir. And you have an oath that you had to adhere to, is that right? Yes, sir. And during this process, this entire process, um, you have, just tell us whether you believe that you have upheld your oath. Yes, sir. Every syllable. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Could I enter into the record the opinions of, of some who submitted them, uh, civil rights and other organizations of, of various kinds to the record, Mr. Chairman? Without objection, so order. We now recognize the gentleman from Michigan Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Coming from the auto capital of the world, let me, for the record, also make a statement that I'll, I'll back up the reason why I did. Uh, the president was involved, but it was not the president that saved the auto industry. It was the American auto worker that saved the auto industry and is doing that to this day. And I think it's also with the Internet. The president has his right to make statements. Many people have a right to make statements. Congress has a right to make statements. Um, the question is, Whose internet, internet is it? I contend it's the American people's. It's wide open, it's broad, and it's worked pretty well. This is not opening up, in my opinion, the internet. It's closing it down. Mr. Wheeler, on November 7th, going back to some uh, earlier questions, uh, the day after Zentz uh, visited you, uh, the Wall Street Journal reported that the FCC was likely to delay net neutrality rules until the next year. Was there ever a point in time when the open internet issue was intended to be on the agenda for December 11th public meeting of the Commission? Yes, sir. I was trying to push for that, but it was not. Possible. What happened to push it off the agenda? It was just, it was a bridge too far. It was, it was. Bridge too far you in can, whose, you whose can, mind? You can, you can whip the horse, but you can't make it go faster sometimes. But in whose I mind was it a bridge too far? Uh, those, the, the staff, those of us who were trying to, to put it together, we just couldn't get the work done. <clears throat> when your statement announcing the new rules, you call the new rules historic and also, quote, a shining example of American democracy at work. If that's so, why did you not let Americans see the rule before voting on it? Oh, golly, sir. Uh, we followed the process that has been in place at the commission um, for both Republican and Democratic uh, chairman um, for recent memory. It was a matter of this is, but the people we, never saw the rule. We were very, they, we were very specific in putting out a fact sheet and saying this is what we are looking at. Then we went into an editing process, which is not unlike you know a judicial kind of a situation. But you went, you where went you're through going that. Back and forth. You went through that in your your opening statement, all of the process, right. giving them drafts, and that's great. Mm -hmm. Little idea of where you're going. Mm -hmm. And that developed over time. But ultimately, the language of the rule was not submitted to the, Americans, to the American eyesight to view and ultimately com comment on it. And why was that? Well, that is the, the typical process at the agency, as it has been forever, um, is that a draft rule is put out by the chairman's office and then the commissioners go into editorial negotiation, if you will, sure. over what the final rule would say, and that's normally a three-week process. The, that does not involve putting out the rule. But in light of the monumental process this was, this is the most monumental change to the rules of the Internet in the history of the Internet, wouldn't you say? Uh, it is a it is a letting down saying down a it's huge sets of rules yes it's huge mm -hmm. and in light of that an emotion that I feel back in my district and I'm sure everyone on this dais feels it in their district 
uh, people commented on it. You had 140 members of Congress. You had, had over f four um, million comments from people and entities concerned with this issue. I just don't understand why at the very last, when you're going to have the rule as written, that it wasn't released to the public for a comment. Would, if you did it over again, would you have done it differently and let them see it? No, sir. Because Why not? It was, it, first of all, it wasn't a final rule. There were changes that were being made in the process. Second of all, it is against the Commission's procedures to do that and always has been. Thirdly is... I don't that, know that, that to be true. Or, uh, in fact, I would regard that as not true. Uh, uh, in, with Commissioner Pai, he called, and I quote him, a monumental shift toward government control of the Internet. In light of this monumental shift, what harm would come from letting the American public see the text of the draft rule before the FCC? We didn't. We didn't vote hide the P, sir. We we put out specifics. This is what it does. We um, we then engaged, as we always do, in private, in camera, um, editorial negotiations amongst the commissioners. We never put out a draft before those edits. That is not true. I'm sorry? And, and the American public deserve the opportunity at this level, at this time period, to have comments and opportunity to push back. This was a shift, a monumental shift, that should have had that oversight. And Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman will yield. I yield. You have the discretion to make it public, and you chose not to, correct? I have the discretion. It is not the practice of the commission to do. You that. have the discretion to make it public, correct? So can I? Can I? The That's answer is yes. Okay. Well, but you have. Can I, can I respond? Effect, to you? No, you can't. Hold on one second. Chairman Martin, at the request of members include, of Congress, including Senator Obama, who insisted on the openness when he was the senator, and they did it. They came and testified to Congress. They made the rule open, and they went through a second comment period, I'm and you chose you, not to. I'm glad you raised that, sir, because I think that that's more urban legend than fact. My understanding of the Chairman Martin situation is as follows. One, that he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in which he released two paragraphs of an order. He followed that with a press release in which he released one and a half pages of a 41-page section of a 124-page item. That's a difference between releasing an entire item. He made himself available to Congress. They went through a second. And what's startling to me and what's telling to me is that Senator Obama's position on this is totally different than President Obama's position on this. Time, time has expired. We're now going to recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, for a very generous five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, Chairman Wheeler, um, is it unusual for an independent agency such as yours to communicate with the executive branch? No, sir. Is, is it routine? Yes, sir. Does it compromise independence? as you understand the word? No, sir. Are, would you, if we examined, I mean, the chairman began uh, his questioning by reading off a list of meetings that apparently we're supposed to see as sinister, you uh, or your colleagues meeting with various White House officials, would that be uh, unique to your tenure as chairman? I mean, we, previous chairman never did that, is that correct? Uh, I haven't seen the logs, but I believe that every chairman has these kinds of meetings. Is there something sinister, though, in the timing of these meetings? So, uh, I, because I think the insinuation from my friends on the other side is meant to suggest uh, that there is something really deliberately sinister here. Your meeting with them either to tailor the rule or to get your instructions or to have some kind of quiet, sub rosa conversation that obviously the public isn't uh, aware of. Is, is that what occurred? Uh, no, sir. Did the White House ever direct you in the wording, framing, or content of the rule? No, sir. Ever? 
even when they filed, it was not a direction. It was a here's our opinion, which, as I say, is the same opinion as 34 members of Congress had been, or 64 members of Congress had been writing me to express, and millions of Americans had been writing to express. Right. And, and as we just saw with a, a letter to the Ayatollah in Iran, one doesn't always want to put too much credence in letters from members of Congress. It has to be put Can in I a context. I pass on that one, sir? Yeah, I know. Uh, I thought I'd just sneak that in in my five minutes. Um, okay. Um, is there, the chairman was just suggesting in his overtime that um, you could have waived the rule and, and by extension should have waived the rule to bring the public in at an earlier date in the draft or the drafting of the rule. Um, you, your answer to that was a little bit juridical. Yes, I have that power, but it is not our practice. Going beyond that, though, following up on the chairman's question, why, why in looking at that ability to waive, did you not avail yourself of it? There are many reasons why negotiations amongst um, commissioners ought to be in camera. I mean, so for instance, you put out the draft. What do you do then two days later when paragraph three, number four, 345 gets changed? You put it out again and say, oh, hey, look at this. How do you deal with the back and forth between uh, various offices? How do you deal with ongoing research? Is it right to, um, to have this kind of an activity that can be very much affecting of capital markets um, out there, uh, people misinterpreting what this is or that, markets crashing or inflating, whatever the, whatever the case may be. You know, and it's for that reason, those kinds of reasons, that FOIA in specific says these kinds of editorial negotiations are specifically not foiable because they're works in progress. And that was why I made that decision, sir. And that's and, why that precedent exists, I believe. And do you regret that decision? No, sir. From your point of view, by making that decision, you protected the integrity of the process and the content of the rule? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, did you feel when President Obama issued his statement with respect to net neutrality, well, there were press reports at the time that you and your colleagues were surprised uh, or taken a little bit off guard. Mm -hmm. um, you may want to comment on that. But did you view his issuance of such a statement as undue interference in your process, which was still underway? No, I, as, as we've discussed, um, all presidents have uh, have had input to the process um, uh, in in multiple uh, administrations and multiple proceedings. It's not undue at all. Not any different than Congress weighing in with letters or resolutions or hearings such as this. Correct, sir. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If the gentleman yield, I'd like to actually. I don't know if we can put up this slide, this one right here. I'm going to need a copy of that back. But the, uh, your communications person in November, a couple days afterwards, uh, in, in response to your question about were they surprised that it have an impact, um, Sharon Gilson, who's Sharon Gilson? She runs our media operation. She wrote, this question rankles me. Do you take this as twisting the knife? I don't want to overreact, but I'm ready to log a call. So to suggest that there was no, no rankling of the uh, uh, internally there at the FCC, I, I, I think would uh, certainly they're they're emailing back and forth. And again, this gets redacted. I I, I don't see this as part of the public process here that uh, that that re, that warrants any sort of redaction, but. Just thought I'd bring that up. I appreciate the gentleman. Chairman, would sure. the gentleman? For I would just, I would just, since it's my time, if if my friend would just, I just want to remind the chairman. Uh, that's an interesting point. But we had a we had a, a, a virtually identical situation with J. Russell George, 
where his media person issued a statement contradicting his sworn testimony, and he disavowed her statement saying she was misinformed. So if you're going to cite a media person as corroborating your point, I'm happy to do so, and now I yield to my friend, Mr. Seconds, Cummings. Um, Mr. Wheeler, I just want you, do you have a comment with regard to what the chairman just said? Um, I actually, th this is the first time I have seen this. This QA rankles me. I'm not even sure what it is referencing. And who is the person writing that? And what level are they on? Uh, Shannon Gilson, and she's the head of the media office. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm sitting here shaking my head at how some of this stuff has happened. I remember back in the 80s and uh, 90s, uh, the Internet grassroots, the Internet activists were fighting to remain, keep Internet service remaining classified as an information service and not as a, a, as a telecommunication service. And the marketing job to completely flip that is, is just staggering to me. But I also I want to uh, address something uh, my friend from across the aisle uh, just brought up, and, and, and that is, oh, wait, I completely lost my train of thought there. Oh, I'll, I'll get back I th to it. I think, you were, I think you were agreeing that I had a brilliant point that uh, <laughs> needed to be I'm going to go on with, the, uh, with my... Because it's St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> uh, on the public comment set, uh, section, oh, I remember where I was going now. What happens is we're, we're seeking public comments on things that we don't know what we're seeking comments on. Open government is about the people knowing the thought process that goes into creating rules and regulations. It's why we have C-SPAN. It's why uh, anybody can turn on and see the debates going on in Congress and reach out to his or her congressman or woman and, and, and give comments. And I'm really troubled by, and I think this isn't just the FCC, this is the uh, executive branch agencies regula creating laws by regulation uh, behind closed doors. You're, you're defending doing it behind closed doors and not letting the public, and I, I just have to say, I personally have a problem with that. The more light of day we've got on that, uh, the better off we are. Uh, so you, let me go back to my public comments in question in particular. I have a hierarchy kind of comments that come into my office. Uh, uh, you know, something that's written, originally written by a constituent, you know, thoughtful piece is the most uh, important, then something from a non-constituent, then a form letter, and then one of these things that you clip. So is there a breakdown you'd be willing to share with us of the public comments and, you know, it, how they fall within some sort of similar hierarchy? You're nodding your head like y'all think no, kind I, of the same I know, way. I know exactly um, what you mean, um, Congressman. And, you know, I get all kinds of notes that are... Um, that are uh, that range right. from well can you just i'm running out of time yeah but can you provide me with to the handwritten yeah. well, well i'll try i don't know if we can break out four million comments that way but i'll try i mean if it's done it's done whatever information you sure. could uh, you could uh, get on me all right so you've moved the uh, in what y'all have done and i I'm, i think we'll cover more of this in a judiciary committee hearing but i, I have two questions that are really kind of uh, kind of burning on me uh, one is, as you move uh, internet service from an information service to a telecommunication service uh, under Title II, are, are we opening the door to applying universal service fund taxes to, uh, uh, to internet services, to your broadband services? Well, Does this open the door to that? We specifically said that we would not do that in this proceeding. As you know, there is an ongoing joint federal state board addressing that question. Even if it were to happen in a hypothetical, that doesn't mean that the total number right. gets changed. It just means and, that and do you feel the like advisor this, gets Do you feel changed. like the, these regulations and uh, subjecting the uh, retail Internet service providers uh, to more government regulation is going to encourage or discourage more competition in, in the field? One of the things that we, re one of the reasons why we were really focused on making sure that there was no impact on investment capital is because we want to incentivize um, investment. You know, there were. People it, it seems like having to go through a tangle of government regulations uh, and, and be a heavily regulated industry as opposed to just hanging out your shingle and uh, stringing some wires or putting up a, a putting up a radio transmitter to do fixed broadband. Uh, so, so the, 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 there are four regulatory issues in this bill, 
or in this in this rule, uh, no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, and that you must be transparent with consumers. Those four seem to be pretty well adopted. They're in the Republican bill that has been proposed. Uh, in, and I guess in, my in, issue is, you know, my, my mom, before she passed away, only used Internet. But I was her tech support, so I wanted her to have an always-on broadband connection. Right. So anytime her modem didn't connect, I didn't get a phone call. Why? But it seems like under this uh, scenario, uh, she would have to buy a full, there'd be no ability to buy just like an email-only type broadband service. That's yeah. absolutely incorrect. Yeah. Um, there is nothing that we do with retail rate regulation or the way in But which her service provider, I, I couldn't go out and buy something and say, all right, I get my email always on and fast, but I'm never going to stream a Netflix video. Why shouldn't I have that uh, alternative to buy that? There is nothing that prohibits a service provider from having that option. You can have email only. You can say, I want 5 megabits, I want 10 megabits, I want 25 megabits, and you can charge all at different prices. And but, that but it, is, it, I, it, there it's is speed nothing, only. So, there so, is nothing in this bill that regulates consumer rates. And uh, I mean this bill in this order <laughs> that regulates consumer rates. And that was by design to go to your core question of investment. Consumer revenues, the day after this order goes into effect, should be exactly the same as consumer revenues the day before because we do uh, nothing to regulate I, 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 consumer revenues. I disagree revenues. that you're going to see a limit in, 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 in product offering. I don't like the fact that AT&T uh, shuts down my unlimited act or throttles my uh, unlimited access after X number of uh, gigabytes, but... Uh, it, it, you know, I could buy more megabytes for more, or more gigabytes for more money and do that. So I want that choice. I see the, thank the gentleman's thank the gentleman. down. Yeah. <laughs> thank the gentleman. Now I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Wheeler. I want to um, Sorry, I got off. Uh, thank you for your, your testimony. And um, you, over the years, have earned uh, a reputation for high integrity and excellence. And um, when I asked you a little earlier about having taken an oath and whether you believe you adhered to that oath, um, your answer was yes. And I'm just here to tell you I believe you. Thank you, sir. I want to ask you about the actions of the Republican Commission members. We've heard outrage about the president this morning. Let's go to Commissioner O'Reilly, Mike O'Reilly. He is a former Republican Senate staffer who has been act an active opponent of the open internet rule. Is that a fair statement? To, do you know that to be the case? Yes, sir. Okay. Chairman Wheeler, when the committee requested documents from you, we also requested documents from the other commissioners, including Commissioner O'Reilly. And we received them. For example, we have now obtained an email exchange between Commissioner, Republican Commissioner, Mr. O'Reilly, and three individuals outside the FCC. They are Robert McDowell, a partner in the communications practice of a large lobbying firm that represents a variety of telecommunications clients, Harold Ferskovroff, an economic consultant in the communications sector and Baron Soka, the president of Tech Freedom, a libertarian think tank focused on tech policy issues. In this exchange, Commissioner O'Reilly sought edits, sought edits on a draft op-ed he was working on opposing the open internet rule. Chairman Wheeler, were you aware at the time that Commissioner O'Reilly was having these private communications with these individuals? Were you aware of that? No, sir. All three of these individuals have professional interests that could be affected by the passage of this rule. Is that right? Mm, yes, sir. In response to, to Commissioner O'Reilly's uh, request, several of the individuals provided substantive edits. In fact, one response had so many edits that he apologized writing, and I quote, 
I know it looks like a lot of red ink, but I really just tried to finesse, clarify, etc. End of quote. According to this email chain, Commissioner O'Reilly then forward these edits, edits onto his staff, writing, and I quote, this is what he sent his staff. He says, okay, took a bunch and left out some, some stuff. End of quote. Chairman Wheeler, Commissioner O'Reilly's op-ed was published in The Hill on May 5th, 2014. That was just 10 days before the notice of proposed rulemaking was published. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. So these edits provided by outside parties seem clearly designed to affect the ultimate decision of the FCC. Are you aware of any ex parte filing regarding this email exchange or these communications? Uh, golly, Congressman, uh, no. Are you aware? No, sir, I'm not aware. Would it be normal for you to be aware? I mean, I, I mean would that? No. Now, my staff went through all the ex parte filings regarding this rule, all 750 of them, and they could not find one, not one, filed by any of these three individuals for these communications. Do you know why that might be? No, sir. And you just sat here and testified about how you need to go by the rules and you need to file the ex parte under circumstance, certain circumstances. Would you tell us uh, how you feel about that, what you just learned, assuming it to be accurate, what I just told you? Um, Is that consistent with the way it's supposed to, to be, the way you're supposed to operate? I think that it is fair to say, Congressman, that there is um, often a, a free and fluid back and forth uh, between practitioners in the bar uh, and members of the commission. But should, do you think an ex parte should have been, been uh, filed? Uh, I don't know in this specific one, sir. I would let that, I, I don't want to sit here and hip shoot on that. I'd leave that to the party experts. Well, let, uh, let me be clear. I'm, I'm not suggesting that anyone engage in inappropriate activity here, but if the Republicans want to accuse the president of undue influence in, the, in this process, even when he submitted, he did it the right way. Yes, sir. An expert ex parte filing. They can't just conveniently ignore similar actions on the part of on the Republican side. There's something wrong with that picture. Fairness, balance, and I'm concerned about that. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll yield back. Now I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, I want to go back to this uh, Wall Street Journal report, October 30th, 2014, uh, which reported that you and the commission were prepared to move forward on a hybrid 706 type approach. And I think that was consistent with a lot of the public reporting at the time. So is it your testimony that that was not in fact the case, that you were not at that time leaning towards a 706 hybrid type approach? No, there were, we have gone through an evolutionary process and at that point in time we were focusing on a hybrid uh, approach. That is a correct statement. Okay. Um, very good. And so obviously something changed between October 30th and when you eventually uh, submitted this rule. Um, I think it's been pointed out how the president uh, was very uh, forceful in making his, uh, his, his ideas known. Um, did you know that when the commission adopted the rule, and here it is, 400 pages, um, uh, February 26th, uh, 2015, uh, the Democratic National Committee tweeted, uh, congratulations for adopting President Obama's plan. I, I found it out afterwards. It's okay. And so you know that this is being reported as something that is actually the President's plan adopted by the Commission, and it's less that, that this is something that the Commission came up with on its own. Now, you had talked about the release of the report. The report could have been released in early February. The vote happened several weeks after that. Uh, why not just release the proposed rule to the public, given that this is something that, one, has a lot of interest, but two, um, you know, all the comment, all the period and input was done um, really before you had the movement to a Title II framework. So why not just let the people see it? 
So I think there are a couple of things here. First of all, let me be clear that, um, that your comment about a hybrid being on the table um, is correct, uh, as were the other approaches that, as I said, uh, to, to Mr. Jordan, uh, the day following that journal article, the, the New York Times reported that there were four on. The no, I understand day. that, but and, just but with and, the transparency, and, though, and, and, can you can and, you address the transparency? Yeah, I want to. So so, and I this is with Mr. Connolly and I, you know, engaged in this. The 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 I did not release the draft order because it was the draft underlined order. I did take pains to have fact sheets and other outreach so that people understood what was in it. So you're saying, the well, exact just, let me words, clarify this, though, that you're saying it's a draft order until the commission approved it, and that's why you didn't release it? Yes, sir. That's, that is the way things work. Yes. Well, actually, you, you could have released it, and that's been made clear. And I think that, if, particularly in this town, this idea that we're just passing things to find out what, what is in things without the public having access to that, um, I don't think that that works. Let me ask you this. Can you uh, guarantee to the American taxpayer, people who use broadband service, that, that when, if this goes into effect, that they will not see um, taxes show up uh, as contributions to the Universal Service Fund? We have carefully drafted this with two specific things in mind. One, can you guarantee them that they will not pay more? We have, we, have, we have said that this does not trigger Universal Service. Okay, as I said to a previous but, but that's question. been disputed. I know that one of your members I, dissented and said I, that he believes Title II imposes a statutory obligation. I, we're talking uh, past each other. Let me just be clear, okay, because this is a specific point. That, that the provision we have forborne from the provision that would authorize us today in this rulemaking to do that, to have universal service. There is a joint federal state board addressing that very question today. How they resolve things in the future, I do not know. But this rulemaking was very clear to say that we do not trigger that which you're concerned. But it, it does not foreclose it, and the fact that we're in Title II framework, that opens the door for this to happen depending on, um, uh, depending on what, what is uh, decided with that, with that commission. Um, I just look. I want open, robust internet. When I see 400 pages uh, of, of red tape, uh, this to me does not seem what openness is gonna be. And the experience of when the government gets involved in these things, the 400 pages, it's never gonna be less than 400. It's gonna be more. It's gonna metastasize. And government's gonna be able to get involved in, in other aspects of this. And um, I wish the public would have had more uh, input. I know that this is going to be contested, obviously, in the courts and here in the Congress. Um, I'm out of time, and I yield back. Can I clarify one thing, sir? Um, there's actually eight pages of rules in there. Um, the rest is establishing the predicates and the background for, for instance, the court challenge. Thank the gentleman from Florida. We'll now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Liu, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler, for your public service. And I know you'll be testifying in many committees uh, on Capitol Hill. But I have heard a lot of back and forth today, and I just want to get on the record uh, the answer to the following question, which is essentially, was the process followed by the FCC in this case essentially the same process that the FCC has followed in other prior rulemakings? Yes, sir. Okay. And in fact, in this case, uh, there was a lot of public comment, and there's nothing wrong with uh, a commissioner being influenced by public comment, correct? Absolutely. Right. Uh, there is nothing wrong with a commissioner if a member of Congress wrote a particularly compelling letter to be influenced by such a letter, correct? I hope that we learn from the whole process, right. from the record being built. And there's nothing wrong with any commissioners, commissioners being influenced by a president of the United States, provided that that contact is a report in an ex parte filing, correct? We should make our decision independently on the record that has been established by those who have commented. And in this case, the administration did file an ex parte yes. record. And members of the public can go on your website and look at everyone who's filed ex parte, yes. correct? And the President of the United States cannot fire you as a commissioner, correct? Correct. Okay. 
wouldn't we want different folks to weigh in on issues of this magnitude, including not just the president, but members of Congress and public? Would we want everybody to be able to weigh in and you all make your decision? Isn't that the way democracy works? Uh, I think it's the way democracy works since the way the Administrative Procedure Act was structured to make sure that there was an open opportunity for notice and comment, so, and then make a decision based on what, the, what that record was. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. I, I, I thank the gentleman. If the gentleman will yield <coughs> for a second. Uh, similar to what you're saying, I, I, I do think there's room for everybody to weigh in, uh, whether it be the president or a member of Congress, but it is about openness and tra transparency. It is about filing those things, and I think that's what the gentleman's saying. I would hope that we could find other people on, on, uh, uh, people on both sides of the aisle. I really do believe certainly at the FCC and other agencies, that maybe we should require by law that there be a 30-day notice. Take the final rule, give it the, give it the light of day, and let it, let it be out there for 30 days. What, what harm would there be in doing that? And I'd appreciate if the gentleman would consider that. He's a very thoughtful member, and I, I appreciate the time. Would the gentleman yield further? Just, um, you know, you've, you've heard all of this, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'm just curious, um, when you hear the complaints back and forth and here you're sitting here, uh, what I consider to be a hot seat, um, are there things that you would like to see us do, either as a Congress, to bring more clarity uh, or or do you feel like the process is fine just the way it is? I mean, just, I, I mean, because we want to be effective and efficient. We can't just keep going on these merry-go-rounds over and over again. There will be controversial decisions in the future. And going to the, uh, Mr. Liu's uh, comments, I mean, if there's guidance that we can provide that will get rid of any kind of, um, ambiguity with regard to people wondering whether folks have crossed this line or that line. I mean, I mean, and I'm sure you've thought about this a lot, and I know you want to act in the best interest of, of the United States and our citizens and certainly our, um, uh, your agency. I mean, is there anything that you can think of? I appreciate that question, uh, Mr. Cummings. Um, the, um, my goal has been to make sure that I follow the rules. I, I don't make the rules or the regulations that interpret the statute. I try to follow them. You know, the Administrative Conference of the United States is kind of the expert agency when it comes to processes. Um, and, and they and you, I think, have a significant challenge in that the rules have to apply across all agencies, not just the FCC. Um, and so far be it from me to get specific and say you ought to change section 2B3. Um, uh, but I see my job as trying to adhere to the statute and um, the rules that have been put in place to, uh, to, to deliver on, the, on those concepts. Thank the gentleman, and as I recognize uh, Mr. Walker here, I. I I want to respond to what you just said and, that, and highlight again. Under the rules, you did have the discretion to make it public and you elected not to. I think what Congress should consider is compelling you to make that open and transparent uh, rather than just simply making it discretionary. Now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Walker, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <coughs> being a relatively new member in Congress, I'm learning things every day. In fact, I had already knew, known that uh, Al Gore had invented the internet, but today I found out, according to Ms. Maloney, that the president has saved the internet. Um, just to be curious, do you think it's that, is that a, a statement that's fair? Do you think his involvement has saved the internet for the future? Oh, I think that this is a, a, a much bigger issue, Congressman. I think that the internet is the most powerful and pervasive platform that's ever existed in the history of the planet. 
and that it has an impact on every aspect of our economy and every aspect of how we act as individuals. And for that to exist without rules and without a referee is unthinkable. Well, let me go back to what you said earlier. You testified, in fact, today that you did not feel obligated to follow the president's suggestion. So my question is, what exactly was the president's suggestion? Uh, the president filed an ex parte saying that we should have Title II um, and um, we did not follow that suggestion. We did Title II plus 706. He did not say that we should do interconnection. We did interconnection. Um, he did not suggest that uh, we should have the scope of forbearance that we had. Sure, I'm, I'm actually sort of getting to the place as far as your interaction with him uh, when you said he suggested. Uh, there were, what, nine or 10 trips to the White House. Do you remember which time it was suggested as far as where there was disagreement, where there was agreement? I'm sorry, sir. My suggestion, my comment about suggestion was specifically referencing the ex parte that he filed. Okay, well, so you're saying there was no one on one suggestion with you and the president whatsoever when it came to net neutrality discussion? That's correct. Okay. Uh, do you have any, did you have any idea? Let's go back to the, the pictures, and uh, obviously, of the protesters uh, that were there that morning. Did you have any word or any idea? that those protest protesters would be showing up that morning, or did you were you surprised as the look that you had on your face? <laughs> I, was, I was surprised, and, and if I had spent less time brushing my teeth, they would have missed me, because they just barely caught me. So you had no, no idea that those guys, you weren't tipped off they were showing up that morning? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, your posture has been called uh, by some media outlets apologetic since this decision was made. When, when do you think that assumption is being made? Apologetic? Yes. Since the decision has been made, there have been some outlets that have said, maybe not backing up on the decision, but it seemed like it's not as firm as it was when the decision was made. Why do you think that would be categorizing? Oh my goodness, Congressman, I hope that this is not apologetic. I, I said in the press conference after this, this was my proudest day being involved in public policy for the last 40 years as I have. There is no way that I am apologetic. I am fiercely proud of this decision and believe that it is the right decision and believe that it is an important decision not only for today but for tomorrow. You talked about a little earlier that, and I think our former Cong our Congressman DeSantis mentioned this a little bit earlier, you talked about the Wall Street article was wrong. You may have addressed this just a minute ago. Can you tell me specifically, I believe that was your comment, that the Wall Street uh, Journal had it wrong. Specifically, what did they have wrong? Well, what I was referencing was the New York Times article the following day, whereas, as I understood the Wall Street Journal article, and I obviously don't have it, but as it has been represented here, that uh, it said there was one solution on the table. Um, and I, the New York Times the following day says there were four solutions on the table. So and which one is, which one is accurate? The Times is correct. The Times is correct. We've been looking, we were looking at, let me be really specific, and I have constantly said throughout this entire process that Title II has always been on the table. And I said in my testimony, that we were looking at, at, at 706, Title II and 706 in a hybrid, Title II and 706 in not a hybrid, and Title II by itself. The appearance of being an independent agency, which you have claimed probably 12 to 15 times a day, can you, can you understand why people would have some questions when there are meeting after meeting with the White House? Is, the, is there anything that, it, that, that the American people or Congress can see there's a balance where there's also input from the other side as opposed to just one particular partisan perspective? So you know, Congressman, during that period, I believe that I met more than three times as often with members of Congress. And, um, you know, my job is to take input. My job is to provide expertise on issues that are being considered. Um, and uh, that kind of an ongoing relationship with all aspects of government is an important role, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Weider. My time has expired. I will yield back to the chairman. Thank the gentleman. Now recognize. Ms. Watson, Watson Coleman from New Jersey. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. thank you for your forbearance. And thank you for the fact that it seems that you, you responded to uh, the enormous interest and concern with net neutrality. I know I became a, um, I'm, I'm a newbie also, 
but I became aware of net neutrality on, on social media. So thank you so much for that. I wanted to just clarify a couple of things. First of all, with respect to the comment about perhaps we ought to have a 60-day comment period after the final rule, that would then make that final rule possibly not a final rule, and I don't know how we would then determine it to ever become a final rule. Um, you have been, um, it, has been a, it has been stated that you have met with the White House on several occasions <laughs> during what is supposedly a controversial period of time. Was the issue of net neutrality the only thing you were doing during the period of time when you were considering net neutrality? Were there a variety of other issues you may have been meeting with members of uh, the White House or at the White House? And if so, just for the record, might you just want to share some of those? Um, thank you, Congress Congresswoman. Um, yes. Um, so I met on uh, national security uh, issues. Um, we met on trade-related issues, um, cybersecurity, the E-rate, what was happening there. Um, spectrum policy. The White House was obviously very, very much involved in implementing the instructions of the Congress to repurpose spectrum, and we had to work very closely with all the agencies in the White House on that. Um, and um, and the, the spectrum auctions, obviously, as well. Excuse me, I forgot to turn off my Thank you, phone. Mr. Wheeler. That gives, me, that gives us an, an illustration of the variety of issues that you had been addressing. Um, we would love to have the opportunity to work on one thing at a time. You, we know you don't. We know the president doesn't, and we know we can't. So, yeah. I mean, to suggest that that is the only thing that you were doing um, is, is certainly misleading. Um, and it, as a, I, I believe, a mischaracterization of your continued um, uh, statements that, that you were not meeting on these issues, and I have no reason not to believe you. And I, given that this is such a huge issue, that everyone wants access and, and net neutrality, it just seems to me that um, you were quite willing to listen to more than four million people, what they had to say, to all of the um, uh, uh, motions that were filed um, for consideration, including the President of the United States. I listened to him. I think he's really quite brilliant and has great ideas for this country. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to hear your testimony and to be able to give you an opportunity to answer questions as to the kinds of things that are on your plate that you might have been discussing with White House. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. I think the gentlewoman will now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heist, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Wheeler, for being here with us. Uh, it's been pretty well established that uh, there were not, uh, and, and with many excuses, but the FCC did not report various meetings with White House and White House officials, uh, even though you did report to various lobbyists and activists and uh, companies and so forth. Uh, that's well established here today. But how do you, th this does not seem at all as though transparency has taken place. When there is a specific area that is deliberately not reported, the appearance is that it is secretive, that there is something to hide, and you are denying that today. Is that true? Uh, yes, sir. There was no secret. Can you, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood what you're saying. Reporting to lobbyists? I'm not sure what you're saying. parte meant. type thing. I mean, we've got 755 oh, when, entries. When they, when they would yes, file. Yes. I'm and, sorry. And, and, I, there, and there's no filing with the White House I would except would one. As no. So, so, I mean, it, it gives every appearance of secrecy rather than transparency. Would you agree with that? And I think that it has to do with the fact that as the, the, the language of ex parte is, um, when it is intended to affect <coughs> a decision uh, and to provide information of uh, substantial significance. Um, and, and you don't and believe this is substantial significance? Uh, there was when Jeff Zients came to see me, and this is what the president said, this is what the president is going to do. That was substantial significance. Um, 
as a general rule, if someone is offering you an opinion, uh, you would not object to an opinion being offered to you, I'm assuming. Um, I'm I'm just general rule. I just, opinion? Am I open? Yeah, yeah, I'm open we, all, we've got, all we ideas. all respect the First Amendment. If someone has an opinion, yes. You, you, yes, you would feel free to let them have an opinion. On the other hand, if someone uh, or some group, whatever, was trying to uh, give directives to you or the FCC or whatever, you would probably be outspoken against that action. I mean, you've got someone giving an opinion, that's no problem, but if someone wants to be intrusive and give uh, orders, that may be a different scenario. You'd be outspoken towards Gee, that. And I, and I think, boy, did we get opinions on this. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, you, you mentioned a while ago that the White House offered their opinion on this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to put up a slide that we had a little bit earlier, uh, emails from the Chief of Staff to the Senate Majority Leader to, the, to you. And... The, the top line up there that is uh, in, in red, he said, uh, the, the comment is, spoke again last night with the White House and told them to back off Title II. That sounds like a whole lot more than an opinion. Typically, you would not tell someone who is offering an opinion to back off. Would you agree with that? I, I don't understand the parsing of the words, sir. All right, you, you said you don't have any problem. There's no problem typically with someone just giving an opinion. But this is more than opinion because the comment here is tell the White House to back off. So there's more than just an opinion coming from the White House, it would appear. The, you know, and, and the other part about that is that I had, at the same point in time, um, 90 letters from Republican members of Congress saying that I should not do Title II. I'm not which, talking but, about members. Which, of I'm talking was, about this a, statement right no, here that, is the White House. But the point is that suggests that Title II is very much in the mix. This, as I can read, if I can read right, is, is in It says, May. spoke again last night with the White House and told them to back off Title II, went through once again the problems it creates right. with us. This is more than an opinion. This is, this is May. Okay. And as I indicated, um, in May I was proposing um, that Section 706 was the solution. And I learned through the process of this, long before the White House ever had their filing, that seven sec Section 706 was not the answer. But the White and House was not providing an opinion. They were put, putting some sort of directives it, to do something. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been saying comments to tell the White House to back off. It was more they, than an opinion coming from the White House. The, the, uh, you know, I think that you're reading into this, but the, but the, the fact of the matter is... Why, why else would, would the comments be to back off if it's just an opinion? If the, if the White House is offering an opinion, no one would be saying back off. There was more than a, an opinion that was being presented. With, with all due respect, that's your opinion. <laughs> I, I don't think. Well, it's it's your email. Think, it's your email, I, and the words think, "back off." I don't think it's, are pretty strong. I, I don't think that it is conclusive that there that 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 there is more than clearly just what is stated there. It says "back off" because this is creating problems for us. That is more than just my opinion. It's an email. That's his. I yield, that's I yield his my opinion. Time. That's his opinion. Thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize the gentleman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Wheeler, for being here this morning. Um, I think it's, an, it's so important to understand the significant attention that this open internet order has generated and that that interest is primarily in the process as opposed to the content of what the open internet is. And um, having these hearings regarding this process and whether or not you have used discretionary, your discretionary ability um, as opposed to a rule is something that I think um, is also very interesting. And I thought it would be important for us to understand the steps the FCC takes, FCC takes in that rulemaking process. Now, the official FCC blog contains a post from the general counsel, John Sillette, entitled The Process of Governance, the FCC and the Open Internet Order. And Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter that post into this hearing record at this time. 
Without objections, thank, thank you. you. Uh, the general counsel begins by explaining that the FCC seeks to, and I quote, create an enforceable rule that reflects public input, permits internal deliberation, and is built to withstand judicial review. Um, Chairman Reeler, is it an accurate statement that that is the objectives the, in the FCC in its rulemaking? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And after the public comment period, the FCC staff review proposals in light of that public record. So we know the public comment period is, was actually even longer than normally is done. 60 days as opposed to the 30 days that you were required because of the volume and the interest of this. Um, when was that done, the review beginning in light of the public record? Well, the traditional way that we do it is that is that you the, the comment period closes and you have an opportunity to review those comments, and then you have a period where you can comment on the comments and then you review those. Okay, um, and do you remember at what time that that was closed to begin I don't the review those process? Exact dates, ma'am. I can get them for you. Okay, and then the proposed order is distributed to the other FCC commissioners for internal review and deliberation. Again, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And um, and what? Is that time frame? Do you recall how that's long? Three weeks before the vote. All right. So that's, and that's, that's by our own internal. And that's a critical portion of it, right? The commissioner's internal deliberations. Yes, ma'am. And then before the, the vote to adopt the open internet order on February 6th, there were calls to disclose that order. That's correct. Right? Um, and is it a general FCC policy to publicly release an order before the commission votes on it? No, ma'am. And what could possibly be that? The, the issue of influence, undue influence after that deliberation? What, what would the hap that be the reasoning behind that, the rationale? Well, the, the, the rationale is that, first of all, there has been this extended period of, of comment and, and public debate. And then you get to a point in time when you're actually, um, the rubber meets the road and you're, you're drafting and you're going back and forth and editing um, a document that, uh, that changes frequently um, as a result. Um, and that is something that, um, that is dynamic um, and not public. Um, one reason you want to make sure you have the full participation uh, of all of the, uh, of the commissioners. Second, as I mentioned before, the opportunity to, uh, to cause mischief in financial markets by misinterpretations of changing glad to happy uh, is, is, a, is an issue. And so uh, these have always been in camera kinds of, uh, of editorial activities. So then even after the vote, there are then additional steps that are taken before the order is final and ready for release, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you follow those? Yes, ma'am. And that includes commissioners' individual statements um, with their opinions, further discussion and clarification of any significant arguments made from the dissenting statements, and then the final cleanup edits, correct? Yes, ma'am. And when those final cleanup edits were made by the dissenters, mm -hmm. that was about midday, and on the following morning at 9.30, we released the item. And that final order was released on March 12th, correct? Yes, ma'am. So is there... Has there, it appears to be that you did not depart in any way from your rulemaking process in this respect, in regard to the open internet. Um, it's really, it really has been a question to many people's mind and our good chairman and other individuals, whether you used your discretionary outside of what is the general rulemaking, right? That is correct. And if you had used your discretion, then we would be in a hearing about something else as to whether that discretion was appropriate or not appropriate based on the president weighing in on something that had huge importance to the people of the United States. Well, I, I can't comment on that hypothetical, but the point of the matter is that we followed precedent and procedure that has been followed for years and years by both Republican and Democratic commissions. Thank you very much. I yield the balance of my time, and thank you for your... Sure, sure. Uh, I think the gentleman would now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Russell, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Chairman Wheeler, for your long and dedicated public service to our country. I know it's often uh, thankless. Uh, and while opinions may differ, uh, your dedication to it is appreciated. Sir, I recognize your badge. Thank you for your service. Well, thank you, sir. You had stated in earlier testimony uh, today that you came to an evolutionary decision because you determined it was reasonable for ISPs 
but not reasonable for consumers with this ruling. Is it not true that with this ruling that federal taxes could now be applied to consumers where they were once prohibited? I think that that's in the hands of Congress. Um, you all will get to decide that. Uh, right now, the Internet Tax Freedom Act specifically, excuse me, specifically prohibits uh, that. Um, and whether that is changed is outside of But from an informational service to a communications service, uh, by moving it to Title II, does it not lay the foundation for consumers being taxed? Uh, again, that's, that's going to end up being your decision, not mine. Uh, was, it, uh, was it possible when it was just an information service outside of Title II? Um, information services, some are taxed at state levels, I believe. Some are not. Some could be taxed at state levels. I don't. I want to make sure it's could because we have the Internet Tax Freedom Act sitting on top of everything. So, uh, it's it goes cuts both ways. I guess. Okay. Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution uh, states that it is Congress that has the power to regulate commerce. Uh, do you believe this? Yes, sir. Do you believe that the public would have been better served by giving Congress a chance to review the rules uh, prior to their release, especially in light of your testimony today where you said that rules have to apply across all agencies and be considered? This has been, as you know, Congressman, a 10-year process um, uh, where, where there has been multiple input by multiple Congresses uh, uh, along the way. Um, there will be, there is legislation now uh, which is entirely appropriate. I think what our job is, is to take the instructions of Congress as stipulated in statute and interpret them in terms of the realities of the day. Uh, and that is what we did. The um quote uh, that I would like to read uh, to you by a uh, senior vice president of a communications company. It says, the FCC today chose to change the way commercial internet has operated since its <coughs> creation. Changing a platform that has been so successful should be done, if at all, only after careful policy analysis, full transparency, and the Congress, which is constitutionally charged with determining policy. Now, you and your agency have established a clear belief that adopting these Title II rules would create problems, as we've seen in some of the email traffic that we've reviewed today. You also have stated in other emails uh, produced to the committee that you did not intend to be a wallflower in your tenure at the commission. But given the coordinated efforts, the presence or in the pressure of the White House, uh, the coincid uh, coincidentally timed protest and other White House statements, would it be unreasonable then for Americans to somehow feel betrayed uh, that this decision was a cave against your earlier judgment and damaged the reputation of the FCC as an independent agency? Uh, no, and I also think that it's important to go to your, your key uh, assumption there, quoting this, this senior vice president. The interesting thing in all of this is that there are four Bright line rules. There are only four rules in this in this order: no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, and transparency. And all of the ISPs have been saying publicly, buying newspaper ads, <laughs> running TV commercials. You know, you've you've been subject to it, saying, "Oh, we would never think of not doing that." So when this person says it's going to change the basic operation of the internet. There's something, some kind of a discord there, some kind of a disconnect, because they're saying, oh, we're not going to do that. And then they say, oh, but when they require that we don't do that, that's changing the operation of the Internet. And I, I think that's kind of an underlying tension that has been going through this whole thing. Well, I would hope as we move forward uh, in the future, uh, you know, there's clearly going to be lawsuits in this process. There's going to be continued uh, discussion about it. Um, and that we would make sure that Congress <coughs> regulates commerce. Uh, I personally believe that what we will see follow will be a taxation of consumers. I think had they known that, they wouldn't be so quick to click the uh, Internet like uh, to get these four million comments. And I think we've set back uh, free information 
and access to all Americans. And thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. We'll now recognize the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Lawrence, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Chair. Uh, welcome, Chairman you, Willer. I appreciate you being here today. And um, uh, my friend, my colleague stated that there was a statement that you did not intend to be a wallflower. I find that refreshing. Those who take an oath to serve are the people and, and to be part of a regulatory process should not be a wallflower. They should be actively engaged, and I appreciate the passion you have distributed today. I want you to know, when I came to Congress, I, too, um, had heard a lot about this net neutrality, have done my homework, and I came to Congress with an open mind and willingness to see both sides of this issue. And I also am aware that over four million people filed public comments with the FCC, four million. Um, most of them average people voting yes. And I also saw the President's comments on this issue. So one of the things that I, I want to ask of you today, Mr. Willer, is to really uh, solidify you in this position. Um, Chairman Willer, you were supported by telecom companies when President Obama selected you um, to this position, is that correct? I believe so, yes ma'am. And you were unanimously, meaning both sides of the House, confirmed by Senate as well? Yes ma'am. So it was not just one side of the House, of the Senate, it was both sides? No ma'am, yes ma'am. And then from 1976 to 1984, you worked for the National Cable Television Association, which is clearly representing these agencies that would be affected, and eventually became the president and CEO. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And from 1992 to 2004, Chairman Willie, you served as the president and the CEO of the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Clearly, you would not be a wallflower. Um, so you know this telecom industry very well because if there ever was such a thing as an internet or ISP, you would know that, correct? Uh, I've sp spent my professional life in this space, ma'am. So would you, knowing this, would you push for regulations that you knowingly uh, were aware that would damage the industry that you represented for so many years. So the decision that and the regulation that you advocated for, your position was this would not damage but enhance. That's a, uh, thank you, Ms. Lawrence. That's a really good question. I think there's two answers to it. Um, number one is that, um, yes, I was the chief advocate, chief lobbyist for those two industries when they were growth industries, not the behemoths that they are now, but a different, right. different time. Um, and I hope I was a pretty good advocate. Mm -hmm. um, they were my client. My client today mm -hmm. is the American consumer. Yes. Um, and that's who I want to make sure that I'm representing. Yes. Now, doing that, you do not help the American consumer by cutting off the nose of those who provide competitive broadband service to spite your face. And so what we were doing in this was balancing the consumer protection with the, uh, with the investment necessary to provide competitive broadband services. And I went back to my roots um, as the president of CTIA, when the wireless industry sent me to Congress and said, we need to be regulated as a Title II common carrier with forbearance, um, and Congress agreed with that, um, and that's the rules under which the wireless industry, wireless voice industry since then, has, has had $300 billion in investment and become the marvel of the world. Um, so, the answer is yes on both fronts. You can't help consumers if you're not st stimulating broadband growth. Um, uh, but my job today is, is representing American consumers. And just for the record, because the, the questioning today 
is inferring that, would you support <laughs> regulations, and you eloquently state it, that there is a balancing of this and information in your experience um, bring you to this point? Would you support regulations that will hurt ISPs just because the White House uh, thought it was a good idea? Uh, throughout this process, I have been trying to be very independent and very thoughtful. And lastly, do you honestly believe that net neutrality will stifle innovation, hurt access, or hinder the growth and development of the telecom industry, given your 40 years of experience? No, ma'am, and it's not just my opinion that counts, however, but when, when major internet service providers like Sprint, like T-Mobile, like Frontier Communications, like Google Fiber, like hundreds of rural uh, uh, providers say that they too believe they will be investing and continuing to grow competitive broadband, I believe that's reinforcement of this point. Thank you for your service, and I yield back Thank my you. time. Thank you. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Wheeler, for testifying. Palmer. You claimed in your opening statement that this was the most open and transparent rulemaking in FCC history. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, you've claimed in your testimony that all of your communications with the White House were properly accounted for with ex parte filings. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Would you put up the slide, please? We have a slide. While they're uh, working on that slide, I, I have here a copy of um, your ex parte filing for the President's statement on net neutrality. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, it's two paragraphs long, uh, three sentences total. Um, are we left to believe that the entirety of the White House's involvement in this process can be captured in, in just three sentences? I, I'm now being passed. <laughs> Okay. Matt, thank you. This is the this is the letter, uh, November 10, dear Mrs. Dorch. Yes, that's correct. Um, and I believe that it has then a two-page attachment with it that gets quite specific and says um, what bright line rules should be uh, and uh, and things such as that. That wireless should be covered and things like that. I mean, I, mean, I think that's the. Do we have that? Uh, I they're working on getting it, but I believe the portion that deals with this topic is, as the gentleman says, three sentences. Three sentences, yes. I disagree respectfully, sir. The, 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 they, they put in here the entire statement uh, of the president in which he was saying, this is what I think we ought to stand for. If the gentleman who yield, are you, are you telling us that Jeffrey Zients came over to meet with you to suggest, to, and just read the president's statement? I'll yield back to the, Mr. Palmer. I don't think that was the question. I'm, maybe I'm confused here. Well, let me, Mr. Palmer, I'm, let me be a little more specific. Your calendar shows in February 2014 you had two phone calls the same afternoon with the counselor of the president, uh, John Podesta, and uh, with the White House Office of Science Technology Policy. Is that correct? Uh, if the calendar says that, I, I don't recall talking to Mr. Podesta, but if the calendar says that. Um, you don't recall talking with Mr. Podesta, so could you give us an idea? Do you have any recollection of a phone call with Mr. Podesta on that day? I, I, if the calendar says, sir, we'll, I'll, we'll, I'll stipulate to it, but, you know, let's. Uh, do you recall talking to the uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy? Uh, I've talked to them, yes, multiple times. Can you uh, uh, give us an idea of what was discussed in either of those calls? Uh, I don't recall the specific, what was the date that you were specifying? February of, of uh, last year, 2014. Uh, I don't know what the specifics of, of that call were, I don't recall it. Um, but do you have a recollection of, of having those calls? If my calendar says um, then, uh, you know, I, I must have. I don't have a recollection of it. And, and, well, and the other thing is, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that are going on uh, that, uh, that um, are, are, are relevant. I, I don't, but I don't know what we were talking about. 
Well, if it shows up on your calendar, and if you are having a difficult time remembering the calls and certainly the content of those calls, should uh, should either of those calls have been recorded as ex parte contacts? I, I think there's two answers to the question. One, I, uh, I don't recall the content. Uh, secondly, as we've discussed previously, there are specific guidelines uh, as far as ex parte is going to guidelines rules as far as what ex parte is and thirdly that um, there is and has been since the first Bush administration uh, a ruling that contacts with the administration and with the Congress are not ex parte. Last question here. Um, what other contacts do you recall that you've had with the White House staff prior to the April 2014 emails that have been publicly released? I, I, you have my calendar and you have my emails. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. Now I recognize uh, the gentleman from California, <coughs> Mr. DeSalonier, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to um, Thank you for your service, and I, I'm tremendously um, proud of not just your decision, but also your testimony today and how you've handled yourself, particularly considering, as one of my colleagues have pointed out, your, your background. Um, and coming from the San Francisco Bay Area, the, obviously the importance to innovation for us and having many constituents and friends who work at companies like Facebook and Google and Apple. We want to make sure we get it right, and also having a presence in my district of AT&T and Comcast, I understand the balance you had to go through. And I also understand the importance of the balance of your independence and expertise of um, independent commissions and their relationship with the administration and Congress. And I actually think that there is an, obviously a, a very strong argument to be made that someone like yourself and your staff are more appropriately situated to avoid some of the politics and make these decisions. Having said that, um, I was particularly taken by your comments to one of the questions about whether you were, uh, in, uh, by appearance, looking like you were sort of second guessing your decision um, and your vote and your response to that, I thought was very forthright and very, um, um, very determined and clear. So that was to the decision, knowing that the process is probably as important and the, and the perspective of the prospect process is as important as the actual decision making. How would you respond to the question of are you equivocating about your, your concerns about the questions you're being asked and the process? Uh, so I believe that we handled this, Congressman, as just as any other uh, uh, issue that comes before us, uh, you know, whether it's exciting and headline grabbing like this or much more mundane things we normally uh, deal with, uh, that we use the established procedures um, and precedents um, uh, very religiously. So would you say that your comments about your pride in the actual decision making, you feel equally as proud as the process? I think the process worked, sir. Okay. Um, so you commented about the number of um, the input from the public, the four million comments. Uh, would you ascribe a, a reason for that? I've gotten lots of input. I know we all have from average, everyday citizens. Would you ascribe a motivation? You know, I think that the Internet touches people's lives more than any other network, um, probably in the history of mankind. And everybody, believe me, everybody has an opinion about the Internet, and everybody wants to talk about the Internet. Um, and so when you begin um, uh, addressing issues such as will the Internet continue to be fair, fast, and open, th those are things that it doesn't take an engineering degree or a computer science degree to be able to understand. Those are things you can understand that affect people individually. And I think that's why we had this kind of response. I appreciate that. It's interesting sitting in this room and seeing behind you a picture of uh, the connection of the transcontinental um, railway now. 
when you look from a historical perspective of how government, the federal government, has handled what would be considered assets of the Commonwealth, but also wanted to be fair to the people who were investing from the private sector, whether it was railroads or television or the media, um, from your perspective, one of the concerns is who benefits and who does not. And usually the poorest Americans have benefited the least, at least in the short term. Do um, you have any comments about this rulemaking and the digital divide? Will it, will it um, help eliminate that? Or by not doing this rulemaking and having an, a, sort of an opposite rulemaking, how it would affect the poorest of Americans? If you do not have access, free, fair, open access, then you per se have a divide. And, um, and so when we come out and talk about how there needs to be, no matter where you are, no matter what legal content it is, that there should be open access to it. That's the predicate to not having a divide. Not to say that there aren't challenges that we will continue to face, but that the baseline is there has to be openness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> thank, thank, the, thank the gentleman. Now I recognize the, the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Bloom, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Wheeler, for uh, being here today and sharing your insights sure. with us. And uh, I must admire your green tie. Obviously, I did not get the memo. <laughs> it is that day. <laughs> yes. I have a general question. You grew up with an Iowa woman who is big into Irish. You make sure that you wear a green tie, sir. <laughs> well said. I have a general question for you and then a more specific question. In your opening statement this morning, uh, you mentioned that one of the FCC's goals, uh, let me get this make sure I get this correct, is to protect the open internet as a level playing field for innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, I am one of those innovators and I am one of those entrepreneurs. My concern as a small businessman, Mr. Wheeler, is I've seen firsthand what happens to private and free marketplaces when the heavy hand of the federal government gets involved. And typically what happens, we see less innovation we see lower qualities, we see higher prices, higher taxes. An example of that recently is the Affordable Care Act, uh, which was supposed to help level the playing field for small businesses. And we've seen there that uh, higher prices, less innovation, higher taxes. My question to you and a question I get asked in Iowa often, Mr. Wheeler, is what steps is the FCC going to take to ensure, to ensure that the internet remains vibrant, innovative, and open when history, once again, has shown us when the heavy hand of the federal government gets involved in a free and vibrant market, bad things happen. Thank you, Mr. Mm. Um, first of all, I'd like to identify with you as one entrepreneur to another. Um, I, uh, I too, uh, have been a small businessman. I've started a half a dozen uh, companies. Um, some worked, some didn't. Um, that happens. And you understand that experience as well, yes. I'm sure. Uh, um, and, uh, and for the decade before um, I took this job, um, I was a venture capitalist um, who was investing in early stage internet protocol based companies. Um, and so I know both personally from my own entrepreneurial experience as well as from my investing experience, that um, openness is key. If the companies that I had invested in um, uh, did not have open access to the distribution network, uh, it would have been an entirely different story. The thing that's most interesting about the difference between, and I think this is what you can what tell you your to guarantee it. This is what you can tell your constituents is that it is openness that is the core of creativity because there should be nobody acting as a gateway and saying, hmm, you're only gonna get on my network if you do it on my terms. 
And the key then is we go to the previous discussion that what you want to do is make sure you, you, you have that gateway, not blocking the openness of entrepreneurs. And at the same point in time, that gateway not being retail price regulated so that it can continue to invest. And that's the kind of balance that we were trying to do. But you would, if I were, I would urge you to tell your constituents the opportunity for innovation and the opportunity for the scaling that is required of innovation has never been greater because the networks are open. With all due respect, many people back in Iowa would say you're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist today. And I have a specific question for you. During an interview at the Consumer Electronics Show in January, yes, sir. you said that you had an aha moment uh, in the summer of that year when you realized the Telecommunications Act of 96 applied Title II classification to wireless phone providers but exempted them from many of its provisions. Uh, later, later in the year, House Communications Subcommittee Chair Greg Walden said that he met with you in November of 2014 to reiterate Congressional Republicans' concern with Title II regulation of the Internet. In that meeting, Chairman Walden said you assured him that you were committed to net neutrality without classification of broadband under Title II. Sounds to me like a flip-flop. Can you explain that difference? I respect Mr. Walden greatly, and I'm going to be testifying before him on Thursday. Um, I, I saw that he made that statement. Um, I went back to the contemporaneous notes from that meeting, um, and um, we have a completely different set of recollections and, in fact, the notes, uh, because my notes say that I said that we would use light touch Title II and Section 706. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what's going on. I, all I'm saying is that those are what my notes are, sir. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. I now recognize uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Wheeler, for being here today. We appreciate it very much. I, in, in the short five minutes that I have, I want to try to get an, a better understanding of two things. First of all, it just it, throughout the process today and th through my reading and through, through listening, it just appears that the whole process, there was more attention paid to the, to the White House than there was to Congress. And I, I just don't understand why that would be the case in an independent body like yours. Did, did you serve on the transition team for the Obama administration? Yes, sir. You did. That is correct. So it's, it's safe to say and, and true to say that you have a very close relationship with the president. Is that right? I'm not sure that I have a close relationship with the president. I know the president. Well, you served on his transition team. I, I don't think he'd have somebody who wasn't close to him on his transition team. Agreed? That, that's... Uh... Good. I'm not, okay. Okay. I'm not gonna. Fair enough. Make fair enough. Patience for the president. Okay. Well, that, he didn't ask me to be on this transition team. Let's put it that way. Okay. Well, after the the rule, the the same the the day after the rule was after the vote for the rule, it, it did it strike you as being interesting at all that a fellow commissioner of yours called the new rules President Obama's plan. Uh, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's appropriate to, to, to state something very clearly that re response to what you're saying. Um, since taking this job, um, I met once with the president in the Oval Office. It was the first week on, first couple of days on the job. It was congratulations, welcome to the job. I understand that. And but in it, that meeting, sir, but my in that question, meeting, he said to me, you need to understand, I will never call you. You are an independent agency. Then and why has, do you think a fellow has, commissioner made been, the comment that this is President Obama's plan for the internet? He, why do you think that someone would make has, that? He has been good to his word, sir. And I, I have no idea why somebody would want to make that kind of. Why do you think opinion. that the Democratic National Committee made the made the statement that it's President Obama's plan? <laughs> um, I, I've, I've noticed occasionally over time that both committees will engage in hyperbole. <laughs> So, so you just think it's hyperbole? Sir. Do you agree I, with, the, with the DNC's statement? Uh, I believe that this is a plan that was put together by the FCC 
So you do not agree with the DNC, DNC statement that this is President Obama's plan? Uh, well, let's, let's get specific. One, he didn't have Section 706 in what he sent when he, when he sent something in. Secondly, uh, he didn't cover interconnection, which we cover. Thirdly, uh, he talked about forbearing from rate regulation, but not the 26 other things that we do. I think that we produced a plan that is uniquely our plan um, and, uh, and is a plan that is based on the record that was established before us and that when the president joined the 64 Democratic members of Congress and the millions of people and said he too thought this made sense, that he was piling on rather than being definitive. Well, all that's fine, but, but let me ask you, through the process of this evolution of the plan, did, did your thought process change at all? I mean, initially it appeared that you had in mind what was referred to as a hybrid 706 plan. You actually used the right word there, my evolution on this plan. I started out with pure 706, um, and then I realized, as I said in my testimony, that that wouldn't work because of the commercially reasonable test. And so I started exploring Title II kinds of... Did, it, did anyone lead and, you in this exploration? Uh, yes, sir. All kinds of commenters uh, and, and a lot of work that was put into that. Do you think any of those commenters were influenced by the White House? I have no idea. One, one final question. Do you feel that you paid as close attention to the White House as you paid to Congress? Uh, sir, I believe that I have frankly spent more time discussing this issue with members of Congress than, um, than with the uh, administration and... Um, then ultimately, do you I feel like you, you full, listened to the input of Congress more so than the White I House? Paid, I paid full attention to the record that was established in this proceeding. And it included members of Congress saying, no, don't do Title II. And it included members of Congress saying, do do Title II. Uh, again, do you feel like you paid as close an attention to Congress as you did to the White House? I think my responsibility is to be responsive to all of the people who are I can't tell whether that's a yes or no. I, I, I think I was very responsive to Congress. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. And I appreciate the gentleman's commitment to St. Patrick's Day as exemplified by that jacket, but the chair is prepared to rule that he has only been outdone by the gentleman from Wisconsin who clearly <laughs> is wearing his colors today and would now recognize that gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, for five minutes. Uh, thanks for hanging around so long. Last month, the Wall Street Journal, you maybe saw, I had an article reporting that the White House had spent months in a secretive effort to change the FCC course. Did this news come as a surprise to you, or when you heard about it, what was your reaction? So um, there is a standard process, I believe, where the White House works on developing um, their position. I was not a part of it. Were you, did it surprise you when you heard about it? It's not a surprise that something like that goes on. Okay. Um, Last spring and summer, you had various meetings with White House officials. Did you become <coughs> aware at that time that the White House was working on an alternative to your original proposal? I had, had, I had heard rumors that uh, the White House was looking at this, as I say, like they look at all other issues to develop an administration position. Okay. Uh, the White House, apparently in, in uh, formulating this alternative, had dozens of meetings with online activists, startups, traditional telecommunication companies. Participants were told not to, or we believe participants were allegedly told not to discuss the process. Were you aware of these meetings at the time? Um, I knew that there was a process, that there, that, that there were this, this group. I did not know who they were meeting with. Okay, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Wheeler, as we now um, wind down this hearing, Mr. Chairman, I wanna thank you again uh, for your uh, testimony. Um, I think that um, there will, you know, when decisions are made by various bodies, commissions, um, Quite often, people are in disagreement with those decisions. 
And I don't think there's anything wrong with looking behind the curtain to try to figure out what the process was because one of the things that we've been pushing very hard on in this committee is the whole idea of transparency. And so your testimony has been very enlightening. I think we need to keep in mind, you know, that these decisions are made by people who come to government, and they don't have to do that, but they come to government trying to uh, bring their own experiences to the table, um, their concerns and their uh, hopes of bringing us more and more to that more perfect union that we talk about. And so I want to thank you for all that you've done and continue to do. And I want to thank the other commissioners and your employees. I think a lot of times in these circumstances, uh, we forget that there are employees who have worked very hard uh, on these issues and trying to do it right. And so, so that's very important. I hope that you'll take that back to your commissioners and uh, the employees. And I'm hopeful that we can move forward here. And again, I, I've listened to you very carefully. Um, there was a moment I mentioned to my staff that um, kind of touched me a bit is when you were asked whether you were backtracking on your decision and the passion that you responded and saying that absolutely not. This is a decision that you all made and that you are proud of it and that is something that's very important to you. Um, you can't fake that. You can't fake it. And as a trial lawyer, I'm used to watching people testify. And another thing that you said, and you were very clear, is that um, you adhere to, to the rules. Um, and, and I appreciate that. And I believe you. And so um, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, and again, I want to thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you, you being here today. Um, we, we were made aware that the uh, Inspector General has opened an investigation of this process. Are you aware of that investigation? No. It's uh, my understanding it's not an audit, it's not an inspection, but an actual investigation. Would you, will you be willing to cooperate with this investigation? Of course. Of course. I. Uh, I think one of the key things, and it was brought up on both sides, is the, the process of openness and transparency. My personal opinion, there could have been a lot more done to maximize the transparency and the openness. The rules do allow you latitude to give it more transparency than you did. I think one of the things our body should look at is compelling that openness and transparency rather than making it simply discretionary. And that, that's something we'll have to take back because there are rulings that go one direction or another. Some people are happy, some people don't, aren't. But the idea that the public could, say, have a 30-day opportunity to see the final rule, I think rings true with a lot of people. Uh, this, uh, this notion that uh, right up until the time you voted for it, nobody outside that commission is, is, uh, is allowed to see the final product uh, does not... Um, uh, does not lend itself well to, to maximizing openness and transparency. And that's just my comment. It's not a, it's not a question. But I do think a 30-day window would, would do that. Um, I, I also think that um, the interactions uh, with those who have an opinion is fine. It's a healthy one. But the lack of disclosure about those, re overly redacting emails does lead one to believe that there was a bit more of a secret type of communication going on there. And I think you can understand, at least I hope uh, uh, that you can appreciate why some people would come to, the, to, come to that conclusion, particularly given the dramatic change in the, in the policy that you took. Nevertheless, I think this was a good and healthy 
hearing. We appreciate your participation. That's what this process is about. It's, uh, it, there are fact-finding things that we engage in, and I appreciate your participation here today. We do have a number of outstanding requests from the FCC that we would appreciate your uh, 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 providing that information to this committee. Some take a little bit longer in time. Some are fairly easy. Uh, but we appreciate your staff who have to do a lot of this work and, and thank them for those efforts. Uh, this committee now stands adjourned.